Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to this uh, international OBE symposium 2022. And the theme for our symposium this year is uh, non-conventional teaching and learning activities in engineering education from the OBE perspective. So today, inshallah, uh, our program consists of two sessions. We have one technical session where we have a number of presentations. And the chair for that session is Professor uh, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed, Ahmed Faris Ismail. And then we have a panel discussion that will be in the afternoon. It will be late afternoon here in Malaysia and after the prayer in, in Bangladesh. And that one is uh, chaired by uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Abdul Hasib, inshallah. Uh, so uh, then now it's time then to start our uh, first session, the technical, technical session. And uh, I will hand over the control to Professor Ahmed Faris. Uh, but before that, I will take one or two minutes just to briefly uh, introduce Professor Ahmed Faris, our chair uh, for this session. So uh, Professor Ahmed Faris Ismail uh, has graduated as a chemical engineer in 1988 from the University of Austin, Texas in the United States of America. And then he received his PhD in engineering from Rice University, Texas, in, again in the United States of America. And that was in 1993. Uh, he is now a professor at the Faculty of Engineering at the International Islamic University. At the same time, he is also uh, the Deputy Director, Academic and International Internationalization at, at the same university. He is the co-chair of the UNESCO Chair in Future Studies. Uh, before that, he served as a Dean of the Faculty of Engineering for about 14 years, more or less. Uh, he's also, or he also served as the uh, co-chair of the Malaysian Council of Engineering Deans, and that was in 19, uh, sorry, that was in 2007. Uh, his research activities include uh, topics like energy, in, in energy and environment, computational fluid dynamics, combustion and nanofluids. Uh, he published more than 200 papers he co-invented more than eight patents. Uh, he's a, he's a, a well-known keynote speaker. Uh, his activities include many countries like Jordan, Morocco, Indonesia, Uganda, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Bangladesh, Syria, Iran, Turkey, Pakistan, India, Sweden, Malaysia. So almost all the Islamic countries and maybe a little bit more than that. So he is also a chief editor of the uh, International Islamic University Engineering Journal. He was a visiting academic at the University of Southern Queensland. He was a graduate. Uh, he was a scientist at the Graduate School of Engineering in Japan, in Kyoto, Kyoto University. Uh, he is particularly uh, active uh, in the area of engineering education. He organized and he participated in many workshops and lectures uh, covering topics like outcome-based uh, education, uh, academic self-assessment, strategic plan and balance uh, scorecard, invention and innovation, curriculum planning and management, professional ethics, outcome-based education again, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, he also received uh, the Federation of the University of Universities of Islamic World Tribute for personal, uh, personally having contributed to the development of Islamic university education. And just last thing to mention is that he also served as a consultant for the Islamic Development, uh, development uh, Bank, and he contributed uh, toward the development of some uh, academic uh, uh, institutions like the Musa bin, uh, Musa bin 
Birk University in Mozambique. Uh, he, he helped in developing the, the master plan for that university in August 2003. I think with that, I end my introduction and I hand over to Professor Ahmed Faris uh, to, yeah, to chair this uh, session. Ahmed Faris, please, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Al Sheikh. I mean, my old friend, old colleague, for a very uh, generous uh, introduction. Actually, Prof, I am very a small, small man. <laughs> okay, so Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Very good uh, morning, or maybe afternoon now in Kuala Lumpur, and maybe good evening to our doctor. Javid in Oklahoma, and of course, uh, for the rest of the participants all around the world. Indeed, uh, I am very grateful, uh, praise be to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing me to join this, I would say that very important uh, symposium, very timely. I like your team. I would like to congratulate the organizer. Uh, led by, of course, Professor Mazharul Islam as the organizing committee from Ahsanullah University of Science and Technology, Bangladesh. Uh, the theme is very catchy, non-conventional teaching and learning activities. Uh, I guess uh, this is very much relevant post-pandemic. Uh, we learned a lot from the pandemic. I guess uh, the last time we had this OBE symposium organized by you, Professor Mazharul, was during pandemic, I think. So I think uh, now that we are now post-pandemic, uh, I always uh, remind my colleague that let us take good lessons from the pandemic. Uh, I don't think we should go back to the old ways of doing things. And I'm very happy to see that this is the theme of our OBE uh, symposium uh, yesterday and also uh, today. And uh, we hope that uh, what we learned uh, will also enhance our uh, education, in talking about the future education. Okay, so this morning, uh, this session, uh, we have very good uh, four presentations. Uh, I mean, the first presenter will be Dr. Javid Kitur from University of Oklahoma, USA. The second uh, present presentation will be done by Mr. Nah Tahzinul Islam from York University, Canada. The third presentation uh, will be delivered by Dr. Nashara Hani Binti Jamadun from UKM, Malaysia. And the fourth presentation for this session will be delivered by Professor Dr. Muhammad Res Resudin Khan from International Islamic University, Malaysia. So let me, I mean, let us go first to our first presenter and let me introduce our uh, first, first presenter, Dr. Javid Kitor is currently an assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma, uh, USA, and is currently teaching freshman and sophomore engineering courses uh, for the rest of the world. It is first year and second year courses. Uh, Dr. Kitor has a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical and electronics engineering and PhD in engineering education. His research interests include persistence of students in online undergraduate engineering courses, data analytics in engineering education, engagement of novice engineering education researchers in conducting engineering education research, engineering faculty preparedness in cognitive effective and psychomotor domains of learning. So I guess with this expertise, it is very relevant to our two-day symposium. Dr. Kitor also is currently serving as the associate editor of the Journal of Engineering Education Transformations, JEET. He has published papers in various conferences and journals related to engineering and engineering education research he has authored more than 30 papers in reputed conferences and journals. Particularly, his work is published in various IEEE international conferences, International Conference on Transformations in Engineering Education, 
American Society for Engineering Education, Journal of Engineering Education Transformations, Computer Application in Engineering Education, IEEE Transactions on Education, and International, International Journal of Ed Engineering Education. He is also serving as a reviewer for several conferences and journals focused on engineering education research domain. So I guess with this background, I think the, he is uh, very, very uh, much uh, relevant to our symposium and his topic will be design and implementation of flip classroom. So with that, Dr. Javid, I pass the screen to you. Maybe Thank for you, half an hour, yeah for, yeah, for 30 minutes. Yeah, sure. Please. Yeah. Thank you very much for the generous introduction. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Good morning. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right, so welcome everybody uh, to this presentation. And in this presentation, I'm going to uh, talk more about design and implementation of flipped classroom. So this slide should basically summarize what a flipped classroom would look like. It essentially has three different components. So the first component is the before or pre-class. Then we have a during class uh, component and finally is the after class component. So let's try and look into each of these one by one. So the first one is before class, that is students prepare to participate in class activities. So essentially what students do before the start of the class is, they are assigned with certain course materials, which students are required to review and come prepared to the class. Unlike the traditional or unconventional classroom where students just come to the class sit and probably listen for an hour or 50 minutes from a lecture. But in this flipped classroom pedagogy, students have to come prepared and without students coming prepared to the class, so this model is not going to be a successful one. So it is very much essential for the instructors to make sure that they have all the required course material available to students uh, before the class so that all students access it, review it, and come prepared to the class. So once students have reviewed all the course material and the second component is during the class. So what students do in the classes, they will get chance to practice and apply the key concepts. So again, unlike the conventional or traditional classroom, in this particular section of the, or the class, uh, the teacher or the instructor would be acting more so like a facilitator where the teacher is going to walk through and talk to students, help them solve numericals or clear their discuss, uh, questions if they have any. So more or less, this class would the class time would be for discussion than just you know lecturing. There could be a brief section of the lecture, but most of the class time is going to be just students practicing, applying what they've already learned uh, in in the pre-class activities, and there'll be a lot of questions, discussions. So again, unlike the conventional classroom, here it's going to be a lot of interactions, discussions where students participate, talk and ask questions. And this will also provide an opportunity for the instructor to provide feedback to students uh, at different time points in the class. If they have any questions from the reading material or when they're trying to apply what they learned, if they are stuck at certain points, they can always ask questions to the faculty member and they, they will then and there get feedback as much as possible, which definitely is not uh, how it works in a traditional classroom. So once that is done, the other part is again, the out of class activity, which is after the class. So now students have sort of done some sort of pre-reading before the class. They have got a chance to practice, validate uh, the concepts that they already learned, uh, get clarifications or you know, if they have any confusions or questions about concepts, so they can have opportunity to talk to the instructor, their peers, and get clarifications on those. So the last part would be is, uh, again, students can check their understanding, finally, once again, uh, and extend their learning. So like, again, going back to the first phase where students just have some pre-readings, 
if they have any questions, so they get chance in class to validate, verify it. And if there are any confusions, all those will be cleared. The same thing can still be applied again at the end of the class or after the class where students are required to take uh, do some practice homework problems or take a test or an exam, uh, more so to again validate their understanding uh, of the concepts covered in that particular uh, 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 reading material or the course material that was assigned before class. So let's dive deeper and see what exactly happens uh, before the class. So as I said earlier, students get a chance to review the course materials. Uh, again, these course materials could be divided into chunks, uh, maybe like every lecture wise uh, or a concept wise. So you can share videos. Uh, again, there are two options when you're sharing the videos uh, in the form of course material. These videos could be uh, created by the instructors just to give a personal touch and make students feel more comfortable. So that's one option. If uh, your, your institution has these resources and infrastructure to help you record good quality videos uh, and make, make students get that personal touch from your, uh, the faculty, great, you can do that. Otherwise, you can also make use of the existing resources online and uh, you can have some links or videos put up, but a uh, word of caution here, it's very important as instructors for us to be very sure of what material we are uploading online and uh, make sure the content in that video is relevant to your syllabus, to your content, to your concept, because everything that's available online might not be uh, the best or the correct uh, uh, example or content. So making sure and as instructors taking that lead in reviewing the content before you actually upload uh, or give it to the students is very important. The other uh, form of course material could be textbook chapters. So uh, you don't have to essentially uh, upload the entire uh, or share the entire textbook copy with the students. Uh, you can share some PDF files. Maybe you can take uh, information from different resources. Essentially, our aim should be to help students read and the reading should be easy and fun for them. Uh, they should uh, the bottom line is students should understand the concept. That is what uh, this pedagogy is aiming for, right? And so making sure uh, you have information, it could be a combination of videos and some PDF files, or maybe some sort of uh, audio files, if there are any. Again, it, it just depends on what type of course you're teaching and what resources are already available or what resources you can create as a part of that concept. So uh, as I said, if students do not come prepared to the class, uh, this pedagogy would just fail as is. So it's very much important as instructors for us to know if students are actually reviewing these uh, course materials that we've assigned. So how do we know that? So what we can probably do is we can design an assignment, create an assignment, and make sure that students respond to that assessment. And that assessment for instructors should give us an overview of uh, if the students, how many students have actually taken that assessment and how did they perform on that assessment? Because their performance is sort of an indicator to their understanding of the concepts that were, that were covered in the review material. So one of the things that uh, you might have this question like, you know, how do I know the students are actually taking it up? Or how do I motivate students to take that uh, assessment before the start of the class? So I generally assign some points and I make that as a graded component of my course. And that is sort of one way of motivating students to, uh, you know, take that assessment and then come to the class. So uh, I'm, my background is uh, in electrical engineering. So I have some sample uh, questions here. So generally what I do is uh, I design a questionnaire or an assessment, which has 10 questions. And generally this is like a quiz that I set up and I have different levels of questions. So for example, question one, if you see, is this very simple, it's like a fill in the blank question, which would require students to just, you know, uh, show their understanding uh, or uh, more so if they remember what was, you know, covered in that material, if it's a theorem, it's a statement, is basically checking their memory. Likewise, question two uh, is a second set of question. Uh, this will sort of have a little more advanced or it will require a little more work from the student. Uh, and here I'm sort of checking their understanding. Question one was just checking their remembrance. Uh, so here is asking them to, uh, you know, uh, sort of, you know, make, make some calculations and uh, uh, sort of uh, whatever they've reviewed in the course material and just see if they can get the right answers. 
And the last one is more so something like applying, and this is a little more uh, complex than the previous two questions. So I make sure uh, that I have these three different levels in the questions because uh, it's very important to know if students are actually uh, understanding uh, if or if they've already understood uh, what was given as a part of the course material. And these questions will help us. So I have, as I said, I have a total of 10 questions. So I made combinations. So like I have uh, two complex questions and then three, um, uh, you know, moderate the question two types and then the remaining is question one. So essentially it's going to be 10 points, sorry, not 10 questions, it's going to be 10 points. So I divide it like that. So again, you're free to choose uh, based on how much freedom you have in designing your assessments and, and uh, how much time you can dedicate to that. So, but this is something very important. Uh, I just thought of including these as examples as to what type of uh, questions you can have in the uh, pre-class assessment. So uh, after you have created an assignment, and students have responded, the process does not end there for the pre-class component. Uh, you have to collect these student responses. And then the very important uh, part after you collect these responses is for you to analyze these student responses. Why do we do this is we want to understand if our students are performing well on these different concepts, if they've understood these concepts uh, really well or not. And as an output of this assessment, we should be in a condition to identify uh, which concepts uh, students uh, like performed really well, uh, in which uh, their performance was average and poor, because that in a way will help us decide the overall understanding levels of the entire class. And that data is very, very important for you to decide as to what you want to do in the in-person section of your uh, class. So based on uh, the good average and poor student performance on the different concepts that were covered in the pre-class uh, course material, it becomes important uh, to consider uh, the aspects or concepts where the performance was poor or average and plan uh, uh, or make a plan such that you address those concepts briefly in class uh, so that students have some more instruction on that and have better understanding. So that's something uh, as an important step we should always be uh, looking forward to. And once you have that, uh, you know what your uh, student's performance is, uh, what concepts their performance is poor and average. So, and you have a plan ready in hand. So once you have the during class as the in-class period, you have to execute the plan that you created with an intention that you clarify the concepts, which sort of need attention because their performance was either poor or average on some of the concepts that were identified. So again, unlike the conventional or traditional classroom, uh, we do not want the entire ta class time to be used in just lecturing or, you know, uh, explaining the concepts. We want the entire, most of the class time to be used for discussions, questions, uh, student to, uh, working in teams and things like that. So uh, take some time, like let's say 10 minutes out of a 60 minute uh, class and just explain those concepts in brief. Uh, then let students solve these problems in groups. Uh, let them apply after you've explained them in brief. So what I generally do is I let students first solve these problems in group uh, as a first iteration. And then as a part in the second one, I let students uh, solve these problems individually first and then discuss with peers. So as I said, there's going to be a lot of noise in this class. Unlike the conventional classroom, students get to talk, discuss uh, with their peers, with their instructors. And you can have different strategies to form teams. So what I generally do is uh, I take students as previous year's uh, uh, grade point averages, and I know which student is done well, which is not. So I form teams in a way that each team has at least two students who have performed fairly well, and the rest need some sort of more support, uh, probably identify themselves as slow learners. So I form teams with a combination of such uh, students based on their grade point averages. And uh, sometimes you can also form these teams based on how they've performed in the pre-class assessment, right? So again, depending on what works best for your course and how much time you have uh, uh, to do these things, uh, you can accordingly decide and do that. So in, in certain cases, it also happens that you have a teaching assistant in your class 
or a mentor who can help you. So that's also going to be very, very important and helpful because students, you can cater to students uh, in a way that the one on one attention would be better if you have at least one teaching assistant helping you in the in class discussion uh, section. So uh, once that is done, once you have done the class, you explain the concept briefly, and then you have these activities happening where students get a lot and lot of opportunities to practice uh, and get their questions clarified, get their doubts clarified, and sort of must become, uh, sort of have a mastery on the concepts. Uh, the next is, as I said in the first, one of the previous slides, so you give them one more opportunity to uh, practice some more problems. It could be either in the form of homework or assignment. And also, if you want students to seriously take it up, uh, conduct it like a post test or an exam, take home exam where students are given some time to you know work on this and submit their assignments. So again, depending on how your system works, how or what type of your course is, so you're free to decide how much or what type of thing you want to take up. So some of the reasons why uh, flipped classroom uh, models generally work is that students can revisit the, con the content uh, whenever they want. Uh, so one of the important aspects in the flipped classroom to be successful is you need to have a learning management system where you sort of have all your content loaded and made it available to students. So students can access it as and when required. They don't have to, you know, wait for a specific timeline uh, so they can do that. Then most of the class time, unlike the conventional one, will be used to uh, have discussions, uh, clarify questions. So it's going to be uh, very high on student engagement, uh, unlike the conventional or traditional classrooms. So that's another reason. And course instructors will have uh, often a lot of opportunity to provide instant feedback, which again, like in a conventional classroom, either students have to have one or two internals and then a final exam. So waiting for a long time to get a feedback is something that happens in a conventional classroom. But here, there's, there are opportunities for more and more instant feedback uh, so that students can learn better. And the lessons can be more personalized. Uh, so depending on how the students have performed on uh, the pre-class uh, assessment, you get an idea as to what uh, or what concepts need more attention. So in that way, uh, you know, you can prepare a lesson which is more so catering to the needs or requirements of students. And also uh, students uh, as a part of the split classroom, students uh, can have their learning in their own pace. There is no like competition that, uh, or there's no uh, fear of time in their head. Like, okay, this is like a one hour lecture and the instructor is going to teach this and that's done. So just because the uh, resources are available online, uh, it becomes very easy and handy for students, you know, to learn at their own pace and take charge of their own learning. Let's quickly look at some of the advantages of flipped classroom. Uh, so one, again, as I said earlier, the classroom behavior is going to be really, really enhanced and improved. Uh, even though it's going to be a little noisy, it's worth it because students get a chance to interact, learn from their peers, ask questions, and practice, practice, and practice, uh, unlike a, a traditional classroom. And uh, students will have a larger control on their own learning. Students start taking charge of their own learning, which is very important as an instructor for us to make students realize that this is something that they have to, uh, you know, uh, keep doing, take charge of their own learning and take a uh, lead in that. Uh, identification of thinking errors. Uh, again, students uh, do their pre reading. They take the assessment, they realize probably, oh, uh, this is something that I've misunderstood or uh, they have a misconception. So all those questions or thinking, whatever they've been thinking about a concept, if they're incorrect, uh, they have that opportunity of clarifying in class with different activities and instructor briefly explaining it. And also they have another opportunity after class where they practice some homework assignments or again, take an exam or post test. So multiple opportunities uh, would be given. Uh, this flipped classroom will provide enhanced student collaboration. Uh, so as I said, most of the classroom time would be for active and collaborative activities. So collaboration is something that is going to be there as a part of this uh, flipped classroom pedagogy. Access to curriculum materials. Uh, again, this is something uh, as one of the most important points is students have access to the materials 
whenever they want throughout the semester. So one of the important things when uh, what I do is uh, we use uh, Canvas as the course learning management system here. And I've also used that in the past. So uh, one of the best parts of this Canvas that I feel is it lets you create uh, different tabs wherein it's going to be like week one, this is the material or concept wise, you can create the material. The more easy it is for students to access the material, the better it is because if students are not able to access the course material in the first place, that itself is going to frustrate them and take their interest away from the course. So making sure you have that is very important. Uh, as I said earlier, again, so engagement between students to students, students to teacher, and if you have a TA teaching instructor, teaching assistant, so interactions between them will also increase unlike a conventional classroom. So having this is again very important. And uh, one advantage for the, from the faculty point of view is that uh, if you have designed this course and if you've delivered this course once using a flipped classroom pedagogy, you don't have to probably do it for the entire course because that might be too much, again, depending on your time and availability. Uh, if you do it for, let's say, 50% of the course and then you already have some videos or you have some uh, reading material already assigned and when this course is offered again the next iteration you can use the materials as is or sort of modify or update again depending on how things have changed over time so that way uh, the load on the faculty is going to be relatively less in the second and subsequent iterations but in the first iteration it would require a lot of uh, more investment on time but uh, I, I would say it's worth doing it and finally, uh, students will have a lot of opportunities to take quizzes and tests, which uh, will help faculty understand at different time and point uh, to, to sort of redesign their core lessons or classes, just to make sure that the students are learning because our bottom line is we are teaching, are they learning? That's something that we always have to keep asking us. As instructors, we only be teaching, but not focusing on if our students are learning or not is something that, uh, as instructors, we should always be asking. So these are some of the advantages of flipped classroom pedagogy. All right, I am now open to questions. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Javid, for very, uh, what you call it, I would say that clear, uh, as well as a clear explanation uh, on uh, this uh, issue of flipped class classroom. Uh, when I was listening to you, I uh, remember I was attending uh, one conference and the keynote speaker was professor from fantasy at that time. This was like, I mean, happened already about 10 years ago uh, when we were starting to have all this, uh, what you call it, uh, 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 website and all these things. So he mentioned that uh, one of the greatest challenge for a professor nowadays is to make sure that students are interested in your classroom. So as a result, he said that uh, you are not supposed to teach to your student anything that is available on the internet because otherwise mm -hmm. they say that students can go and search, you know? So I, think, I guess that when I listen to you, uh, meaning that the student should go and uh, assess all the information and then now, the professors, the lecturers now become more facilitator. And I like uh, some uh, keywords from your presentation, uh, more engagement and more personalized type of education, meaning that some students uh, maybe need more uh, time or more help. Other students maybe can advance their understanding. I guess this is a, a fantastic idea i mean a new a new approach uh, with that okay so i think we ha we have some time for question and answer so i guess uh, i open the floor for anybody who would like to uh comments or ask uh, our speaker uh, i guess while waiting maybe i can throw you one uh, just a short uh you know uh just to I mean to get your to get the to get your input or or or, or sharing of, of experience. Uh, I guess, like you mentioned, I mean you mentioned uh, in um, many times in your presentation, there must be a good ecosystem to do this, right? An ecosystem yep. or a uh, 
to, to make sure that this is successful. I mean, because one, if something, of, so, so to your mind, I mean, maybe you can elaborate further on this ecosystem. I mean, what is required? I mean, from student, lecturer, facilities side, please. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so uh, going back to one of the slides mm -hmm. where I was talking about the course material that you can share. One is creating videos, the other one, uh, one is just videos and the other one is textbook chapters or PDF files. So when we're talking about videos, uh, now we have Zoom to make use of it, but again, in terms of the clarity, uh, in terms of how students like it. So some one of the institutions that I've worked back in India, so they have like a personalized room just for recording lectures. We had smart boards and things like that. So it's as good as I'm teaching in a class, I'm writing on the board, students can see it. And we just made videos like of 10 minutes because students' attention span is one of the major concerns when we have online stuff, right? In person is also a challenge, but then when you have a video, uh, which is especially related to academics, students, are, students always feel bored. So making it just short and making it personalized will in a way help students watch it and complete it uh, as required. So I would suggest if, if institutions can have, uh, I know uh, some institutions have teaching and learning centers, uh, if they can sort of take lead on this and make sure, uh, you know, they start uh, having training or having resources set up on campus and start doing uh, these pilot uh, studies. Uh, they don't have to do it for the entire campus or the entire course to start with, maybe just one module or just 25% of the course, they can, you know, start doing like a flipped classroom and see how it works. Uh, it, it will take time to reach uh, uh, the uh, mastery level, but then uh, it is, this method has been in the literature like for a really long time. It's not something very new. It's, it's been in the literature and it's a pretty uh, old method, but it's still very, very successful. The names have been changing, uh, but yeah, flipped classroom essentially means you're flipping the entire model. So uh, again, uh, there are some videos available online. Uh, if for now you just want to implement this, but then your institution does not have that infrastructure, those resources to help you create those videos, then there's so many videos available online, but make sure you review them critically. Uh, you can also cut the videos uh, just for the time required based on concepts, or you can have some interactive uh, material uh, put up online. So yeah, these are some of the things that you can do, but yes, again, institution-wise infrastructure resources, like having a special mic uh, and having uh, things that's going to eliminate the noise uh, so that the videos sound clear and easy. It should be soothing to the ears, right? It should not be like always disturbance and things like that. Eventually our bottom line is we want students to learn and how much easy and comfortable we make them feel is something very important. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, more or less. I think to continue in that direction, there is one question uh, on the question and answer box here. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, uh, flip classrooms have pros and cons. On the other hand, they help teachers save valuable class time while boosting student engagement. On the other hand, they can increase preparation time for teachers and can present challenges to students. So can you comment on this? Uh, in, in the, in yes. the what, what are the extra preparation time and as well as what are the challenges for the students? Yeah, please. Yes, so uh, I see two parts in this question. And for the first part, yes. So in any teaching pedagogy you take, any method you take will definitely have pros and cons. So coming to this flipped classroom, some of the positive points is the advantage that I discussed. But then one of the things is, uh, I, as I also mentioned in uh, the uh, one of the slides, is that the time that teachers have to invest is very, very high because they have to create videos, one, or they have to look for videos, review them, and all of that. If I'm just going to do a traditional chalk and talk, I just prepare myself and then go to the class. The preparation is still there, but then the time that you have to invest uh, in creating all the course materials for the pre-class activities. Then you have to also design the assessment, you grade the assessment, then analyze those assessments, then have in-class activities, work on that, come up with questions just for the in-class, make teams, uh, then design some out-of-class activities and assignments. So that is definitely going to take more time compared to the conventional or uh, the classroom time. Uh, some of the challenges, uh, so that is from the teacher's point of view, but then the advantage for the teachers is if they prepare this once, uh, 
the subsequent iterations of teaching the same course would be relatively easy because you already have the course material. And having teaching assistants is one of the very, very important uh, part here because, for example, designing assessments or grading it or forming teams, right? Part of the work can be sort of escalated or shifted to the teaching assistants and the instructor can focus more on uh, the concept and teaching and things like that. Uh, coming to the challenges uh, to the students. Uh, so if, if your institution is not using the flipped classroom approach in the past, the students might feel a little burdened because you're asking them to do a lot of work before class, right? Uh, because when we did it for the first time, like students were like, if we do everything by ourselves, then why are teachers here for? So it's going to take a little time for students to understand and adjust. And as instructors, we have to always tell them that you are now grown up, you can take charge of your own learning. Why this is done is it's to sort of help you learn better and master, uh, gain mastery with the concept, right? So in a way, uh, th this is one of the challenge. So the other challenge would be especially slow learners, even though they have access to this material online, uh, considering how our courses are structured and how our semesters are structured, uh, this is not the only course that they're studying. They're studying multiple other courses. So even though this course is sort of giving them personalized space for learning, uh, the time that instructors giving them feedback is only in the class. So again, that can be mitigated by smartly designing assessments and giving a good gap between the pre-class assessment and the class time so that slow learners have more time to you know, respond, read the review materials, have questions jotted down and then come to class. So yeah, does that answer your question? Okay, good. Uh, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, I'm just uh, would like to I mean read one uh, I guess a suggestion uh, on the chat box here. Uh, mm -hmm. that there is an article on the flip classroom during the remote period of COVID student perceptions compared to pre-COVID times. And then I think mm -hmm. that this of author here, Clark, Kao, Lou, and Scott. Okay. So mm -hmm. There's a suggestion here. Sure. Thank and, you very much. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. But, but maybe related to that, I mean, based on your experience, I mean, and you are in engineering education uh, specialization, I mean, do you have like feedback? Uh, I mean, uh, doing flipped classroom and normal classroom and how students and teachers uh, I mean, view them? Yes. So again, as I said, uh, teachers will have to put a lot of effort. Uh, but that's only for the first situation. If you're teaching, for example, like if you're teaching a core course so in electrical engineering, circuit mm -hmm. analysis or network analysis or even linear control systems, these courses are going to be there like forever, right? Come what technology or anything, these courses, this, these are the core and conceptual courses, they are going to be there. So if you take up such courses and design these, right, it's going to be a lot of uh, resistance from faculty initially because if I'm doing a chalk and talk, I don't have to put so much time and effort. So there's always resistance from faculty, right? The less of the work they get, the better is what they think for themselves. But then in the long run, that's going to be very, very helpful. So that is one of the uh, things that faculty always resist because they do not see the uh, long-term benefit or value in it. And eventually, as I said, uh, one of the mantras that I've been hearing from Professor Krishna Vedula, who's probably one of the panelists this afternoon. Uh, so he says always, uh, we are teaching, are they learning? That's very important. So just going to class with them in that as a faculty, I am prepared, I can teach, that's important. But at the same time, are you concerned about your students learning? Are they really learning? I know mm. we are teaching, but are they learning? So th these are some of the small and little steps that we should take as instructors because we are in this field, which is very, very noble and important. So that's something, but yes, there is resistance and there, the resistance is going to be there forever. From students' point of view, as I said earlier, students feel like if they're not used to something like this, they feel like there's so much work being given for us to do. I mean, like we have to do work before class, during class and after class, and they start complaining. This particular professor is giving us a lot of work. Uh, we have other things to do as well and things like that. But then again, sort of explaining and justifying this approach and telling them how their learning can shift and what are some of the advantages of doing this. So it's going to take time uh, and we, there's so much literature available uh, using these as uh, some of the statics, statistics to help students also understand what this approach is, why we're doing it. Eventually the benefit is going to be for the students, right? 
So th these are some of the things that we can always try doing, but yes, uh, resistance has been there for anything and everything on this planet. So and flip classroom is not uh, very different from any other thing on this planet. So yeah. Okay, I guess uh, maybe uh, I will just, uh, maybe I, I will, uh, I mean, for the last question, because I think we are running out of time, I will combine the two questions on the on the chat box here. Uh, one, they're talking about, you're talking about a lecture load. What could be the lecture load as per your experience for your model? And related to that, there is a specific question. Is it mandatory to provide video of a class lecture of faculty himself? Can he or she give other lecture video link from YouTube or something like that, or without any video, only lecture slides? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe quickly. Yes. 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 So uh, for the uh, lecture load, so you don't have to do it for the entire course. As I said, maybe you can just start with one module uh, because we're not teaching just one course. So it's as good as if you're doing flipped classroom for one course just by itself. It's as good as you're teaching three other different courses. So in total, that much workload uh, is going to come out to that much if you are essentially creating your own videos. If you're looking for videos which are already available online, that's also possible. But please make sure you do not upload videos which are like for 60 minutes or 30 minutes. That's a lot for students. Students are not going to read it. They're going to just skip it and then, you know, try and cheat in some ways to complete the assessment. So if you create your personalized videos, one of the advantages is you can have assessments put in between and students cannot skip that before taking the assessment, right? So that's the advantage of do, doing, uh, uh, creating videos. So the two questions, so the lecture load, I think is going to be like four times uh, than teaching conventional. If you design everything all by yourself, create videos, create reading materials to make it easy for students. And uh, the other question was using the YouTube, YouTube videos. You can use it, but please make sure you cut it short. Do not make them more than 10 or 15 minutes you can have video one two three and four but don't just combine them and put it one uh, as one video link uh, so that's not going to be very helpful students attention span is very very less so that's what yeah that would be my comment okay so with that i think I, we would like to thank you dr javid for a very clear presentation and very clear articulation of the subject so thank you very much uh, for your presentation but, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank so you. with that, now I think I can now we can now move to the second presentation. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Tahzinul Islam from York University, Canada. So let me introduce the speaker briefly. Uh, Mr. Tahzinul Islam is currently uh, doing his PhD in mechanical engineering uh, at the York University. Uh, at, at his core, Mr. Tahzinul enjoys problem solving. His social motivations have fueled his aspirations to bring affordable water technology, whether for portable water, steam ster ster sterilization, residential heating or laundry to the refugees, indigenous communities, disaster victims, and gender rural populations living off grid. I mean, I should salute you for this uh, effort, uh, Mr. Tazinul Islam. His current research motivations and interests of specialization involve integrating solar radiation and desal desalination to build eco-friendly, self-sustaining thermal systems. In the near future, he also has plans to integrate agricultural systems and crops with novel self-sustaining solar technology. So today he will be presenting uh, to us the topic of teaching fluid dynamics through a narratively driven concept review MMO-RPG game, uh, which is massively multiplayer online role-playing game. I guess, I mean, teaching fluid mechanics through games. So with that, uh, Mr. Tazinol, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, happy to uh, start. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, yes. 
Okay, so um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm happy to present today on uh, teaching fluid dynamics through a narratively driven uh, concept review MMORPG. Uh, we've been talking a lot uh, yesterday and today about uh, new learning technologies and um, learning with games is uh, one of the newer learning technologies um, we've been doing recently and there's still a long way to go, which I hope to inform you on today. So. Uh, basically, I have a small icon at the right here, which kind of summarizes what we're trying to do here in this uh, project at York University. Uh, we're trying to package STEM information in a palatable, like uh, easy to digest MMORPG game. And uh, it's easier said than done. There's a lot of challenges. And we would like to borrow from existing gaming technology to get this done. So uh, currently, we have 15,000 uh, Canadian dollars in funding. And um, uh, so far, I mean, uh, I'm the project lead on this, uh, first year PhD. And um, I also have uh, other people on the team working with me. We have another first year PhD student in software. So um, the learning pedagogy is coming from my side. And then um, Moshi, uh, the person I'm working with, is uh, he's more of an expert in programming in C++, who's uh, helping me build the game. And there's also two other professors, um, the course director for Fluid Dynamics, um, who's mainly supervising us, as well as my supervisor, who's uh, provided a lot of inspiration in terms of oral examination, which is going to be a key strategy in the game today. So um, let me start off with the gap in mechanical engineering education. And we all know this, so this is more of like a review. Um, and uh, basically, I'll go on after, you know, talking about the gap on how we can use serious games. Um, games, you know, we typically think of fun games, but serious games is more an educational format. Um, and we'll look at how specifically um, we can use MMORPGs. It's a specific genre of serious games to achieve this. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to maybe show you a 15 minute demo. So I'll try to relegate, um, delegate half of the time today in mainly the game demo, which I hope to show you with a video today. And we'll We'll basically end off with a discussion on, you know, does it work and what are the pedagogical components of a game like this? So um, the gap in mechanical engineering uh, education, I've, uh, there's a lot of problems, but I've tried to briefly categorize into three. We have problems in uh, three major domains, which, uh, which we can broadly categorize as cognitive, psychomotor and uh, effective domains. Cognitive meaning raw information, psychomotor is more of the hands-on and effective is more of your emotional, uh, uh, your emotional interactions with information, which goes a long way in memory retention, which uh, studies have shown. So um, starting off with the knowledge, let me just go back here a little bit. Retention is a problem. Um, just, yesterday, just two days ago, I was speaking with the course director on fluid dynamics specifically, and the frustrations just keep coming. Like, I just taught, and he, he knows some of the students by face, I just taught a course in flow engineering and dynamic pressure. Whereas um, now, you know, just two months later, they have completely forgotten what dynamic pressure is. You know, they've spent entire weeks learning it, but just two months later, over the summer break, they've forgotten everything. So this is a common problem we hear all the time. Um, it's simply because students are just vomiting information. They're just memorizing in bulk and just vomiting out and then, uh, they forget everything the semester afterwards. So how do we avoid this? And more, more importantly, how do we avoid plug and chuck uh, attitudes? Plug and chuck is basically you memorize a formula. You don't know what anything in the formula means. And you just, um, you just substitute. You get the equation from a friend, maybe. Maybe you cheat. Um, very common. And you get the right answer. And you, get, uh, you pass, but you don't know anything about the concept. And that's very common. The last thing is information overload. Um, this is something that the Q&A in Javid's uh, session was kind of uh, talking about. It's basically, um, we have so many different uh, methods of delivering information, textbooks, slides, videos, assignments, quizzes, activities, you know, flashcards, Quizlet. So like, how, how do we like put it all together and make it time, like, less time consuming? Um, psychomotor skills through online education has always been an issue. Um, in the future, we'll probably go towards like virtual reality and like hands-on type of, uh, there are haptic feedback gloves that are getting cheaper now. So there are like controls, like vibration controls and things like that, which are getting easier, um, which are getting developed, which uh, can fill in this gap of psychomotor. How do we make people know how to disassemble and maybe have hands-on skills, uh, you know, just from online? It's a very difficult uh, problem. 
And lastly, um, lastly is the effective domain regarding technology, like the emotions uh, people have and, and the attitudes they have towards technology, including sustainability, cradle to grave designs. Um, there's an entire course we have here called life cycle engineering. So it's more in that realm. And then also social engineering and how technology makes its way into society, how it's related to industry and so on. So when it comes to serious uh, game literature, um, basically, uh, I'll just show you quickly how the search is done. You can just search on Scopus serious games. You'll get you know, a lot of results. And this is just to show you it's a well-developed field. Um, if, if you search serious games and titles, abstract keywords, 15,000 results. In title, 5,000. And if you were to search uh, review papers in uh, title, serious games, you only get 150 papers. Um, so it's a well-established field um, with a lot of niche. But uh, the current niche we're looking at is a multiplayer engineering game. And for this, you'll only see maybe five results. Uh, and I've got, and three of those results are conference papers. So really two definitive work in this type of field. And that's really not enough. And that kind of paves the motivation for us. So massively multiplayer online role-playing games. What is it? How does it work? It's a formula that uh, has shown a lot of resilience in the last 20 years. And essentially it works like this. You have quests, you have items, you have crafting where uh, you, ha you have to craft items and pick up items and you interact with non-playable characters, NPCs. And I'm going to draw this out in the coming slide. Um, so I've mentioned three broad game mechanics, skills, items, and quests. And uh, when we look at like populations of uh, massively multiplayer online games, um, just from the top six games, we have 10 million people, which is enough, uh, is the size of the country of Sweden. Uh, just from six games. So it's a lot of, you can imagine, it's a lot of people that play these games. And in total, we have about 2 billion uh, video gamers um, coming up in the next 10 years. So it's a number that's in the billions and it's a format which everyone will be using in the coming decades. So how an MMORPG works, imagine you have a virtual space, right? And I'm going to show you the game demo, which makes that uh, kind of more clear and how that works. So in this virtual space, uh, you put a bunch of people here, you put skills, items, and quests, and uh, you can think of these as kind of virtual hangout spaces. In fact, today, all of us here are in a Zoom meeting, like this is also a form of virtual hangout. And the, the, the key issue that we kind of faced was translating like uh, from Zoom, which is in 2D, to a more immersive 3D virtual format. And um, in the future, uh, Facebook's metaverse, you know, with VR, you've seen all the hype. Uh, will basically capitalize on this type of uh, technology. So um, players, you have your players, just put them in a virtual space. And I can tell you just doing this, just putting uh, students in a virtual space and letting them talk, it's like putting them in a Zoom, Zoom room with uh, some, uh, you know, some information to get them started. So just this is effective by itself. So let's build on top of this. So um, why don't we add in people who actually orally examine you? on the players, like on this multiplayer experience on, co on threshold concepts. We can delegate NPCs to basically orally grill students to see if they get concepts. And I'll show you how this is done. And we can even have like uh, other NPCs. We can have uh, quest NPCs, people who grill you. And then we have clue NPCs. Um, these are um, kind of like supplementary NPCs who help you get to the information, who fill, fill in that type of gap. And then we also have items which can be rewarded, which can be given and picked up during the quest, which help you make you know, cool gear, uh, frankly speaking, which um, you'd be surprised how far cool gear goes in games. Players would grind for hundreds of hours just for that one virtual gear to basically um, you know, show up to friends. So it's an effective technique. Um, for more on virtual worlds, you can, search on, uh, you can search basically this article by Karina on what is a virtual world. So, um, and basically I'll just end on, uh, I don't wanna spend too much time on the literature, but we have three kind of like very important papers. Um, one by Connolly in Computers and Education, one by uh, Cheryl Bodnar uh, in uh, Journal of Engineering Education, and the other one by uh, Bala Muri Litara in, um, in Computer Applications in Engineering Education. And these three journals are basically, I would say, the authoritative uh, kind of journals in this type of field. There are not many papers in this field, but these three are like the ones that I see have a lot of papers here. And they've done a lot of work in summarizing what this field is all about. So let's take a look at a real game. We've looked at the literature. Um, let's take a game, uh, look at a game called RuneScape, which I've been playing for uh, 
about 15 years now, believe it or not, this is what kind of like a chaotic virtual environment kind of looks like. You put a bunch of players in a virtual space and uh, you'll be surprised how far they go. Um, they come up with their own economies, they have forums, they have knowledge bases, and uh, I'll show you some of these um, right now. But before I show you, like, this is a game, like, which, you know, I, as I said, I've been playing for 15 years and I still have not beat it because um, you have 30 skills. You have skills like fire making, you have skills like fishing and mining and uh, smithing, and you have skills like, for example, wood cutting and crafting. And uh, basically each skill takes 300 hours to uh, fully master. And there's 30 skills. So it's 9,000 hours of content. Uh, in 15 years, I haven't beat it. But the idea is like, and you'd be surprised, people play this for thousands of hours just to uh, max out these types of skills. So the obvious question for me and all of us here is why don't we translate this type of formula into an educational format? And not just that, we, do, we don't just have skills. I mentioned three things, skills, items, and quests. This is items and you have your own bank and your own player driven economy in games like this, um, where you can, it's, it's a stock exchange which updates on daily prices basically. So players are literally, you know, working nine to five in mining and selling their ores and their iron and their bronze and they're making money from it. And it's kind of like a stock and it's a player driven economy. And uh, that's, that's very impressive to me. There's like, a, you know, imagine if students could, you know, do something like this in their own virtual worlds with educational things. And um, with quests, you have entire uh, Wikipedias, like entire wiki bases for quests, um, which are pages long. And uh, it's just ridiculous to me how much time people spend reading when they don't have to, reading for fun, basically. So reading is not the issue. It's the issue is like how we deliver it to them. In this type of format, people are happy to read for hundreds of pages. And you can see a quest like this, like this type of quest, basically you, you talk to this person, you pick up that item. In this type of quest, you're picking up a pressure gauge, a rubber tube and an oil can, you're making whatever, but that's the idea. You're talking to people, you're picking up items and you're making things. And you're doing it, the funnest part is you're doing it with other people. So you're seeing uh, other people will help you out if you get stuck. And if you get stuck, you can look at your quest journal, which will always keep you in track. And this is the map of a game like this. Uh, it's very huge. Uh, there are uh, hundreds of thousands of people, you know, online right now as we speak playing in this type of map. So I guess now I would like to translate your thoughts to like, how can we get that map for education, for engineering? And this is just an example of uh, some of the books that you can find in game. You can find entire books inside the game, which people will pick up and read for the story. So, um, you know, just some, uh, some of the interesting things that are happening here. And um, basically the magic formula here, the main thing I'm trying to emphasize here is the magic formula, which is you put skills, items, and quests in a virtual space, in a multiplayer virtual space. And um, I think I will, uh, just for the sake of time, I'll skip some of these slides, but this is just a time record of some of the players on these types of games. You can see a person over here who has 7,000 hours on this game. And their review is, I like this game, I think. And they, it's one of the highest rated reviews, the joke being that they've spent 7,000 hours in this game. Of course they like it. So it's just to give you an idea of the market, uh, the gaming market, basically. And we have you know, many different types of games, physics, sandbox games, and so on. And um, this is a little bit of like nice to know information, but uh, originally games uh, 50 years ago with the intranet started out like this. They were fully text-based. You know, we didn't really have graphics cards to render all these 3D assets. So we had uh, university students illegally playing these types of uh, multi-user dungeons, as they're called, text-based games using their university's internet, you know, and, you know, internet at that time was kind of expensive and people are, students are using it to play games. So these are the number of uh, active video gamers. It's in the billions. So anyways, I've talked about the literature and, uh, you know, kind of the gaming market. Let me get down into the demo that we've worked on in the project so far. So... This really started in 2017 in my uh, final year bachelor's project, where I looked at a course called engineering design, where students were looking at gears, uh, pulleys, and um, gears, pulleys, and belt drives. And um, my, I was given, my final year project was how to make them fully uh, get educated on these machine components through an actual real world component. I chose a chain hoist because it's a common one, you use it for lifting and I had students uh, disassemble this chain hoist with the help of an NPC character, Ahmed. 
And um, I did some testing on this. And uh, basically, I won't get too much into the details of the testing. But based on these types of components, you know, the nuts, the shaft and everything, and questioning students, um, we gave them a real world uh, toolbox. And we basically saw how uh, we, we saw the comparison between the real world and the virtual um, toolbox. It was a very simple test, just 30 sample size of 30 students. But uh, we saw, um, oops, yeah, I think, okay. My results were <laughs> somehow wiped from there. We saw good improvement using this type of technology. So um, uh, <laughs> I don't know where my graph went. I had one here, but um, uh, just from this simple test. So moving on in 2021 20, uh, last year, um, with the previous presenter actually with Javid, we uh, published a paper in Serious Games and Engineering, uh, kind, of more, kind of like a review of what people are doing in this field. And the idea of this paper was, uh, how can we translate successful game mechanics to um, educational games? And more recently in summer of 2022, uh, we had something called, uh, we used a tool called Gather. And this is a tool anybody here can use. It's basically a 2D virtual space um, I'll show you how this works. So basically we gave students a bunch of treasure hunter cards and we, uh, it has a bunch of conceptual questions. Like for example, um, the Reynolds number is the ratio of which forces? What does a high or low Reynolds number indicate? And uh, they would take these cards, they would log into the game. So you can see me logging in here and they are in this 2D space. And it's literally like Zoom, except you can walk around and there's uh, designated spaces for people to get into like breakout rooms. So the idea is they have this card, they have this virtual space full of all the topics in their uh, 12 weeks, and they have to figure out which topics and they have to look for items. You can think of kind of as like a, um, kind of as kind of like a detective Indiana Jones type of thing. You're looking for clues to the, uh, to the questions on the cards and you're getting money, fluid dollars. And we actually got them chocolates, which they could redeem with these 400 fluid dollars, $500 per chocolate Kit Kat, And they had a lot of fun. Like, this, this was the project that convinced uh, the $15,000 funding that I mentioned, because um, even the professor didn't uh, expect students to be having this much fun with a multiplayer game. And this is multiplayer. You can see I'm, I'm alone right here right now, but um, you can actually do this uh, with you know, hundreds of people, just like a conference. In fact, we hosted two conferences in Gather as well, and it was very successful. So that just goes to show you like how much power is in a virtual space. And I'm try the, what we're trying to go for here is putting weeks of topics in individual rooms to help them mind map virtual concepts to physical like concepts in their head. So, you know, going from the virtual to the physical, you know, when we study for an exam, we do mind maps anyways of the topics and the equations and everything. So here we're doing it in more of a virtual sense. And here you can see the answer to, the, uh, well, one of the answers to the card here, there's, uh, they have to piece it together like a puzzle piece. But the, it's basically clues, not answer. Initially, we had answers, but um, our course director told us that uh, you can't just give them the answer like that. Students will cheat. You have to give it to them puzzle-wise, and they have to put it together in their head. So um, after Gather, we, I proposed the idea to the professor, why don't we basically do this, but make it 3D? Because we have a limited number of assets, um, number of objects we can put into this Gather, and also it's not free. So why don't, we, why don't we basically translate this to 3D and we can use a tool called Unreal Engine to do that. And I'll talk about that briefly. So um, I'm, brief, I'm running out of time. So I'll just quickly get into the game demo here. So um, I'll start off with the island. Uh, you'll see like the island over here and this is only two weeks of process. So it's a little bit raw, uh, forgive me, but um, we're planning to have six quests here in three broad zones. And it should take two to six hours to complete this game. Uh, but you can actually even complete it in half an hour if you know all the answers. So it's a skill-based game. If you don't know the answers, you'll have to do some clue hunting. So um, I'm just hovering over the island now. I'm getting ready to drop down. Hopefully the sound shares. Okay. So you can see. Video stopping here. Okay. So immediately you can see the surroundings. You have a character and he's talking to you. Must be the cry of Paris. You're on Stone Island. Humanity has gone back to the Stone Ages after a nuclear fallout. We are back to square one, but have the advantage of the knowledge from old Earth, which we are using to rebuild technology. In 
in Stone Island, we were put here by Maine Admin to further fluid dynamics knowledge. We are rebuilding aircrafts, turbines, pumps, and other vital sustainable energy. It's a small island of 30 or so people, but we mostly get along, save the snobs up on Hotel City Airbase. Anyways, I would like you to help me recompile all the fluid dynamics knowledge to date. My notes and friends are all over the place. Would you like to take on this massive endeavor of compiling all six knowledge trees for the quest? So you are offered the quest, and this is the first quest NPC. Perfect. And you've accepted the quest. The but first, please note down the image next to you with the challenge problem. So here, I'll just pause for a second. The way this game works is it's a, it's a conversation narrative-based game. And the reason for this is, is the mo least programmatically difficult. If we were to do like, you know, advanced programmatic features, it'd be difficult. We have plans to translate this game, not just for fluid dynamics, but for heat transfer and other fields. And this is the easiest way to do it with conversation. So in this conversation, you have six quests, six, you know, NPCs, this being one of them, and each of them will ask you six questions and very fundamental conceptual questions. We'll go through uh, some of the questions uh, uh, right now just so you can see how a quest goes. And there's also a statue room. The statue room contains records of those excellent researchers who have compiled valuable knowledge from the follow within the past two years. So for purposes of time, I'm going to skip ahead now and show you like before starting the quest, you're recommended to go to a statue room and uh, I'll show you like what's going on here. And I'll show you kind of the space where um, you can already see like it, this is a very immersive virtual environment. Um, it's very well lit. You can see the textures are good, the sound and everything. It almost feels like real life. And that's kind of the idea. Um, it's kind of like gather, but now they're in a real world 3D virtual uh, world. And um, there's a couple of interesting points, uh, you know, a couple of uh, immersive aspects over here we can take advantage of. Uh, for example, social engineering. We can actually build stories into characters, clue NPCs. So they won't just give you a clue. They will also like, uh, you can ask them who they are, you know, what they're doing, how they're doing. It almost feels like a real person. So it gives students a further motivation and emotion to connect with these types of characters. So um, basically you will have two clues here and uh, we haven't gotten to um, the defense as I call it for now. Each quest is structured like kind of like a graduate defense. You're getting grilled by the committee member in this case, uh, the quest NPC on fundamental conceptual questions. And if, well, unlike a defense uh, here, you can actually ask for help. So um, that's the idea over here. And um, here Faye is kind of the museum character. You can ask her, like, you can talk to her about textbooks and things like that. I'm just gonna skip some of these options. And um, basically we are pretty much ready to start the defense and you'll see how this goes. So um, ready to start the first quest. and you're told to note down a challenge image. So each quest will have one challenge image, which um, you can think of these as conceptual kind of uh, images. Like for example, this is the conceptual image, well, at least for me that I use for viscosity, um, which is uh, you know uh, how fluids, uh, the frictional forces between fluids and uh, boundary, boundary layers, if you can uh, think in that, just a quick refresher on fluid dynamics. So give them an easy, simple conceptual image you can parameterize it, you know, add diameters or whatever. And now you will be getting grilled on this simple question, basically. And um, the idea is if you're, even if you're sitting in an interview or whatever, just from a simple conversation, people can usually figure out if you know a topic. So that's what we'll see over here programmatically through this dialogue. So um, let's start. Yeah. Let's see how. Some dramatic sound effects. <laughs> so over here, if you click study of fluids, you'd be wrong. Um, here you can kind of, you know, just have some fun playing with yourself. But it's not, it's, it's structured to not be a multiple choice question. And you'll see how. If you get the wrong answer, you know, fluid dynamics is not just a study of fluids. Uh, we're more concerned with dynamics. We also have a statics component. So there's some trick questions. There's some silly answers in there. 
And if you got the wrong question, uh, if you got the wrong answer, you're told to see a specific person working on that area of the knowledge. So each person in this island, like Faye, is in charge of uh, fundamental fluid questions, um, mm -hmm. specifically for the first question. And for the second question, you have somebody else. So this way you are tying kind of uh, knowledge and information to a specific person in the game. And that adds real value, so you never forget. So the first question, I believe I answered it. Uh, oops. Let me just answer the first, let me just go back a little bit. Okay. Uh, Okay, first question, yeah. The answer, study of fluid motion, that's correct this time. So we got the first one. Moving on to the second question. Um, it's gonna get harder and harder, of course. Uh, what are the types of flows we look at in fluid dynamics? You know, like uh, viscous or inviscid, 1D, 2D, incompressible, compressible. Um, a recap of the different types of flow regimes in fluid dynamics. And um, you'll see basically how this goes. So laminar or turbulent, you only have that option and something else. You have something like vortex flows, which doesn't exist, of course, sonic flows and subsonic flows, um, which exist, but that's not, you know, it's not something we look at in fluid. So there are some trick questions here. You know, you can think of it as a smart uh, multiple choice fragmented, like one question will have a couple of fragmented parts. So uh, it takes a couple of parts to get to the final answer. So this is to avoid students guessing the questions. So the third question, for example, it's asking you like, what's the most important fluid property basically, which is uh, the answer is viscosity. And you're getting asked, okay, it's viscosity, which law dis dictate, dictates this? So you, you have to know not just its viscosity, you have to know different components of it, like which law it obeys and what are some of the parameters in this equation? Viscosity, velocity, and shear stress, Newton's law of viscosity. So um, that's the third question. And I'm just gonna skip ahead to some of the other questions. Here you can see question five and then question six. And then when you do question six, you have completed the first quest. And um, you uh, basically, I'll show you what happens afterwards. Just playing with some sound effects, ignore that either. So after you beat the quest, the rest of the game unlocks. You have more dialogue options with more characters, and you can also um, basically do more things in the world. That's the idea. So uh, one last thing, just for uh, lack of time, I'll just show you like just walking around the island, kind of how it looks. You can see like it's, uh, it's a, you can achieve very realistic looking scenarios with uh, a game like this. And um, basically one other thing I wanted to mention is as you beat quest, this hasn't been added in the game yet, you have something like a knowledge tree. So um, in the first quest, uh, you know, that's the first tree over here. Uh, once you beat the first quest, you'll unlock the subtopics in that area so that uh, this is one of the main motivations of the game. You are expanding your tree and this it's basically notes that kind of reveal themselves as students play the game. So um, that's basically what I'm trying to show you here. Initially, like you might have just mechanics revealed and then your skill tree, and this can be inter interconnected to other subjects as well. Um, you know, when you start the quest, you find out that, hey, in mechanics, we can look at solids or we can look at fluids. And in fluids, you can look at fluid statics or fluid dynamics. In fluid dynamics, one of the topics and fundamentals is viscosity. So this way, the topics are, the concept, the threshold topics are mind map to the students' heads. And that's kind of the idea. This is just me walking around. One last thing I want to show you is um, uh, last, when I, when I TA'd this course in the summer, we tried something interesting in the form of, uh, as Javed was mentioning, a flipped classroom with student posters, whereby we told every week, we gave uh, students a couple of conceptual questions and we told them, draw it out to make us understand for marks. And this is easy to mark. This is so easy to mark. It just takes 10 seconds of a grader like me to look at it and give it a mark, whether they have understood the concepts. They have to give out concepts in poster format. They have to draw it down or take notes. Um, and then the best poster out of, uh, we, did, we tested this on 10 students a week, the best poster is put up for everyone to see on E-Class, on our learning management system. And I'm also proposing for it to be displayed in the game permanently, so that for every batch, we see their posters. So we have like a poster kind of uh, repository. Uh, this is one of the posters I personally liked on the viscosity week, 
one of the students is comparing uh, honey and water, basically the viscosity of honey and water and uh, how, for example, raising the temperature of the fluid will also decrease its intermolecular forces resulting in an increase in kinetic energy, decrease in viscosity, thereby increase in flow. This is answering one of the questions on how temperature affects viscosity uh, fundamentally. So you can see these are some of the posters students have come up with and I put them here in the game and we found this to be very effective. Uh, we gave five, for, at the beginning, we gave 10% marks uh, to these weekly posters. They'll have 10 posters, that's 10% of marks. And we also brought these conceptual questions in the final exams so that students avoid plug in, plugging and chucking. Because the ultimate, uh, this is the ultimate, I would say, uh, anti-plugging and chucking tool. Uh, you have to get students to demonstrate the, con uh, the concepts, not just the equations. So um, with that, hopefully I've showed enough of the demo. I'm just walking around the island here and um, just showing you kind of the textures and things like that. By the way, something interesting, you'll notice this island is in the shape of an aerofoil. This is actually aerofoil island. And in this island, students are learning about aerospace things and compressible flow. And um, it's basically zone mapped to your head. So that way, so that you forever remember that I was on an island, you know, shaped like an aerofoil. You're walking around the island a lot, spend an hour on it. So you will probably never forget the shape of an aerofoil this way. And we can do this for heat transfer. We can have like cylindrical fins. We, you can use any field which has some sort of geometric dependency on a physical phenomenon. So I'm gonna wrap up quickly the presentation, almost out of time. The tool we're using is Unreal Engine 5. And uh, some discussion points here. At a high level, what this game is doing is we're using an MMORPG. It's going to be multiplayer, so uh, the environment you saw will be on a server with other players in real time. And um, we are using something like knowledge trees, tech trees, and story trees. You might have noticed those in the bottom right of the game uh, in, the, in the user interface. And you might ask, why, are, why not just use textbooks for skill trees or knowledge trees? Um, and not just textbook, like lectures, conventional uh, assignments, quizzes, group work, problem sets, things like that. And the answer we all know is it, it just gets to be too much. That's the whole point of innovative technology. So, um, you know, it's all about packaging this in a game and it's doing it in kind of a defense format. You know, as a graduate student, it's, it's a very effective method. The oral examination method works way better, easier to mark than the written exam. But the problem is one professor can't do it for a hundred students, whereas a game can. So that's the idea. The game can also auto mark itself so that professors can just, you know, it's a easily marked thing. And uh, it takes a lot of load off professors that way. You can develop it once, give it to everybody and, uh, you know, everyone benefits. And the framework so far we have, we have three zones and three monthly review sessions. Um, in the summer term, when I did this with Gather, we had one review session at the end, but this time we'll have a review session every week, every month. Each um, basically will have six weekly topics in these three zones. So that's roughly two topics per zone. Uh, and these are physical zones I'm talking about. And six questions per uh, quest, per module. Each quest is a module, basically. So six questions per module. That's 36 questions, 36 conceptual questions in total. And uh, two to three clues per question. You saw one of the clues with one of the characters there, Faye. So let's do the math. That's 36 questions, two to three clues. Let's say three clues. That's about a hundred clues. And these are like mini kind of, you know, helping them get to the final answer. And I can ask you what's the origin of viscosity, but there's so many components to it. There's velocity, there's shear, there's wall shear. There's uh, you have to understand partial differentials. So the clues will help get you there. And there's lots of room of improvement in this level of detail. For now, we're just using dialogue, but you can make the clues very interactive learning games. You can just set up this environment and maybe even cite a YouTube thing or a Quizlet thing inside of the clues. So the clues can be basically anything. We're setting up the framework for this. And uh, let, me, let me look at, a, just gonna try to wrap up in a quick minute here, a mind map of mechanical engineering, right? You have dynamics, solid mechanics, statics, materials, instrumentation, heat mass transfer, thermal fluids, and um, you know, getting statics, you're going towards the civil engineering, materials is kind of chemical and electrical, you have instrumentation. So why, why don't we do this? We're, right now we're doing it for fluid mechanics. In fact, fluid statics. Why don't we, uh, sorry, fluid dynamics, not statics. Um, why don't we translate this to basically every field and we can make interdependencies, inter-knowledge trees between these fields. That would be something of, that's you know, thinking ahead of the future. So this is just for one course. And these are the actual contents of our course of the TA shift that I'm doing, uh, that I did and am doing. 
um, you know, you have fundamentals, you have analysis techniques, like um, we're using Frank White's book, not Chengel, as many people use. So the way Frank White does it is he separates analysis into experimental, differential, and integral. And each one has entire weeks, uh, one week that they spend on. Um, prototyping, like uh, dimensional analysis, CFD, and then turbo, like it's kind of like you have to find uh, ways to segment six topics. We talked about six uh, modules, open modules, which instructors can use. So instructors will use these six modules and uh, design the game that way. And when you hover over a specific part, for example, viscosity, you'll get a conceptual image and a description. So it's really seg segmenting knowledge in a very component-wise uh, fashion, basically. And then you have tech trees. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap up quick. Uh, I know we don't have much time, but these are basically crafting, you know, making stuff and story trees where, you know, NPCs, you can find out, you know, how they're doing, who they are. And you'll for, it's for emotional memory purposes. So in conclusion, I've discussed how to design MMORPGs, especially in the university level STEM format. And we are broadly investigating informational, information delivery in such virtual learning spaces. And um, what I've described to you currently is like a 15,000 Canadian dollar project. And we hope to see a lot of success with this. And it's very early on in the conceptual design phase. We've only spent a month on this uh, virtual, uh, well, on this uh, specific Unreal game. So all feedback and uh, questions are welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tahzin al-Islam for very interesting uh, presentation. I guess uh, we are moving towards metaverse now, maybe in the future. All the universities, lecturers, students will meet in the metaverse, and we, we, yeah. we may also meet engineers designing and constructing in metaverse. Okay, so yeah. anyway, <laughs> due to the limited time, maybe we can see one or two questions. Uh, I think I'm, I'm reading from the chat. I, I guess uh, my my quick my quick question to you is. Uh, the main challenge is, I guess, to develop the game. Am I right? Do you agree with me? Um, yeah. So yes and no. So mm -hmm. it seems like it's a t it's a long journey, but actually, everything you saw in the game is drag and drop. I did not model anything myself. So it's getting increasingly easy. And Unreal Engine Five has an entire three D library. It doesn't have many mechanical components. It has a few pipes and things like that, gears and stuff. But um, in the future, the three D library will expand. It's literally going to be drag and drop. And even the landscaping, you can, I, I made the landscape in 20 minutes. So, um, you know, in, in about a month, you can get an entire virtual space, an island, you can drag and drop, interior decorated. So it's getting uh, increasingly easier for non-programmers, because I'm coming from a non-software background, uh, to make games like this. Um, the only programming component can be done in a visual scripting method. Um, I actually, I skipped over that just for lack of time, but maybe I'll quickly show it. Um, it's, uh, let's see if I can, yeah, it's basically like this. It's drag and drop components, which is visual scripting. So all you're doing is editing the text, you know, adjusting a few nodes here and there. So we've made this in such a way that, uh, you know, anyone with no programming experience can drag and drop and edit a few text bubbles and that's it. Um, yeah, okay. so. Interesting. I think that is, I guess, I guess uh, I would agree with you that with this uh, new generation, I guess, uh, teaching them through games, interactive, I think uh, is, is yeah. more effective, uh, I, I, I would assume. Okay, and, and of course, my last question is, uh, what will be the assessment? You just take the assessment that you mentioned virtually or later on you have to have also the normal exams and so on and so forth. Oh, so this will be like, uh, just a small part of their grade. It won't be like a 40% exam, but right. it can maybe be like a 10, 20%, you know, like a 10, well, some people have attendance, 10%, but it can substitute mm -hmm. for attendance or one of the assignments or something like that. And mm -hmm. it's done automatically because um, to pass the quest, they have to get all six questions right. Um, so it's basically showing mastery of the topic. So uh, it's, it's done pretty much automatically. We can compile that in Excel and the grading does itself based on how many quests they beat. Okay. So very good. I think if you need to test your game, I mean, you can share with us your prototype. Oh, I'm happy to. Yeah, I'm happy to. Testing so with as many test with our students and see how their feedback. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, in the, we're planning for that as well. Uh, we're gonna get to that stage. Hope to pass okay. it around. 
right. So I guess uh, thank you very much because I see that and the other questions are not that relevant. So let, I take the, this opportunity to thank you for your good presentation and good work. And uh, we hope for you to, I um, mean, we hope to, we look forward to your success and then uh, you can <laughs> share your product with us. Okay, thank you, Mr. <laughs> President Islam. Thank you very much. Thank you, my pleasure. All right. Now we can move to our third speaker, uh, Dr. Nashra Hani Binti Jamadun from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, National University of Malaysia. Uh, let me introduce the speaker. Dr. Nashra Hani is a senior lecturer at the Department of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering, Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Her research interests are in bonding technology, which primarily focuses on joining mechanism of materials. Currently, she is conducting research on metallurgical bonding, ceramic bonding behavior, and micro joining of different materials through different manufacturing processes, such as laser join, injection molding, additive manufacturing, and so on and so forth. And I guess, her topic today also is very interesting, related to our previous uh, presentation. She will be talking about augmented reality for an interactive learning experience of manufacturing processes. So the screen is yours, Dr. Nashrahani. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Uh, I hope everyone can see my slide here. Yes. All right. Okay, thank you, Prof. Dr. Ahmad Faris, for the um, kind introduction. And actually, it's really honored to be here uh, because uh, we have been amongst the professors and all the experts in OBE of engineering, of course. And um, I'm glad uh, for the opportunity to attend this symposium. Which, uh, from which I learned a lot uh, of a great deal of information. Okay, so today uh, I'm going to talk about in a 30 to 40 minutes uh, uh, on our uh, experience in using augmented reality uh, for an interactive learning experience of a manufacturing process. Okay, so here is uh, the outline of the presentation, which I divided into five parts. Um, so in this presentation, uh, I will um, guide it auto maneuver uh, all of you here how our finding on uh, AR technology uh, can be used as a teaching tools uh, in one of our topics in any courses. Okay, so I will start with the introduction. Uh, we have to know about the uh, realities, uh, maybe some of the example of the uh, use of AR, and then the motivation. Uh, why is the needs of this AR? And then I will talk on um, uh, what the apps uh, that have been built in the App Store that can be used. And also the current work direction, this is one of my project uh, in this uh, department and also uh, the conclusion remarks. Okay, um, as uh, been um, uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mazal Islam that we have to know uh, what the materials that we want to present or what we want to deliver to our students. So I think this is actually uh, important for us to understand what the realities are, okay? So we know that there are uh, three realities, uh, then namely augmented reality, we have a virtual reality, and we have a mixed reality. And in each reality has their own definition which is uh, the basic the basic concept is where we have the physical reality and then we transform it into kind of a visual information uh, like the one that uh, we uh, uh, heard about the uh, previous uh, presentation in the visual information and then we uh, um, appear it in on, uh, certain devices like laptop, uh, computer, uh, smartphones, uh, tablets and so on. And the combination of this AR, VR, and MR uh, is called the extended reality. Okay, I don't want to uh, give all of this um, definition of uh, depth information of, of these um, realities, um, since our our uh, work is focusing on the AR. So let's take a look at the definition of AR. Um, 
So we know that this uh, augmented reality technology uh, is the one technology that enriches um, the uh, real physical world uh, with the computer generated 3D, okay, uh, of the virtual projects uh, where users can interact and um, look at it on the screen, uh, as I mentioned, as a, a numerous devices such as tablets, their yeah, smartphones or camera. And uh, it actually consists of three uh, this kind of uh, features. Uh, first, it must have the combination of uh, real and virtual objects in a real environment, okay? So it means that uh, our, our environment is a real environment. And the second one, the features that they have is a real-time interaction with the system. So it means that the users may use the AR uh, technology uh, can react to the user input. For example, I want to measure of this kind of this height, okay, of the dimension. So it will give you the information of that. Or when I just touch uh, the screen, uh, what the materials that have been used for to make this kind of um, parts. So that will give you the information of the materials, okay. And the third feature that they have is a geometrical alignment of virtual objects to real one in the real object, okay, in the real world, okay. So they give you the real objects in a real environment in your devices, okay. All right. So there's a, a brief um, introduction of the AR. So I want to now uh, move to the uh, bit uh, history of AR, okay, uh, augmented reality. So the first augmented reality uh, technology was built in uh, 1968 uh, by uh, at, at Harvard by Ivan uh, Sutherland. Okay, we know him as uh, father of computer. And in the following decades, um, many labs uh, and university are now uh, doing the research that um, do the, uh, for the advance of uh, AR technology for the wearables and uh, digital displays. And today, um, as we know that with the industrial revolution of 4.0 has driven the growth of uh, AR technology, okay? All right, let's get an overview of a global market here, okay, about the AR technology. Um, if you can see that uh, the expected market size in uh, 2023, um, the market of uh, augmented reality, uh, marketing value at uh, 148 billion uh, USD and growing, okay. And uh, um, this AR is becoming an increasingly popular technology because uh, we can say that uh, uh, because it can be used in a variety of platforms, uh, desktop, desktop, portable devices, and smartphones. And uh, with the increasing of that technology, it's actually increased this AR market. And of course, within the COVID-19 outbreak also give them harm and the enforcement uh, for the implementation of this AR, okay? And uh, let's take a look on the, uh, the, the, the diverse potential of VR and AR application, okay? So if we can look at the list here, the biggest industries that utilize the AR is uh, from game, uh, video game industry, okay? So this is obvious when um, 2020 uh, with the AR game of a Pokemon Go got a hit around the world, okay? If you're familiar with that. And um, the list followed by the healthcare, engineering, uh, so on and so forth. And we can finally, we can see that education here. Okay, so here we can see that the AR is, has not been extensive, extensively used in um, education area, okay? Then we can see that how the potential, there's a lot of potential that has not yet been uh, fully exploited in this um, technology in uh, education, okay? Um, next, I'll give you, oh, sorry, okay, uh, give you the, uh, some example of the use of uh, AR technology for this one is more for um, conversation, maybe, oh, sorry. I think I have to resume the voice, uh, I'm sorry, it's too loud, okay. Uh, Okay, all right. First, we can see that the Pokemon Go, okay? So it's innovative uh, in terms of the use AR effectively, right? Many people use uh, this as a game, okay? Uh, it's been played uh, everywhere, anywhere, 
even uh, um, Saudi Arabia have banned, uh, have prohibited this Pokemon Go uh, because people played inside the Masjid al Haram, okay? uh, where the people chasing the character in front of the Kaabah, which is not appropriate. Or the second one, uh, so this might be um, the woman should know this app. Uh, this is a very interactive uh, uh, app by IKEA. Uh, so it's called IKEA Place. Okay, so this app lets you visually place your uh, furnishing like sofa, bed, table, etc. in your space. So, so we can get the idea before we buy our furniture, we can estimate the size, the dimension, the measurement or the design whether that fits our spaces or not. Uh, the last example I brought it here is uh, maybe one of you have tried this. So this is actual from the Google Discover. So the Google Discover has employed this AR technology to show uh, athlete in a 3D uh, to celebrate the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. So I've tried this, okay, uh, it's very impressive. Uh, it's very interactive. You can see um, the game uh, in, in front of our uh, places here. So there are uh, two tech giants investing in um, uh, this development of uh, AR. So. It has that max the uh, audience of AR is growing. Okay, so we have a Google and Apple. So for AR core uh, is Google and um, uh, AR kits for Apple respectively, is part of the framework for bringing uh, more AR apps into their platforms, which is they have a lot of uh, users around the world. Okay, and for that, let's see uh, what is the performance of this application of AR in uh, education, okay? Uh, okay, let's take a look in a preschool level, okay? First, um, you know that uh, it's noticeable that um, the augmented reality application can be used in uh, uh, learning activities in a preschool education, okay? This is due to, it creates a sense of reality, right? It can make uh, uh, information colorful visual and um, it de develop uh, students' interaction and fun learning environments. So if you can see that there are lots of, um, uh, apps uh, or AR apps that are available for the kids uh, in for, for the preschool level. Same goes uh, the situation in a secondary and high school uh, where they have um, the system of SMART has been introduced, which is system of augmented reality for teaching, which is uh, why these systems um, allow teacher to teach uh, maths, uh, um, maybe is it language, uh, art, uh, science. Um, or any other uh, subjects in interactive ways. And um, since AR is uh, similar to the game, gamified application, I think it makes the learning process more fun. And since it's a game, as uh, previously mentioned by uh, Mr. Tazin Islam, it it's, uh, motivates students not to give up in the games. So they have to uh, play, 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 and then they gain much more information while they are playing the games, okay? But how about the uh, institutions, uh, high institution or in, in university, okay? So we know that um, the education system nowadays is becoming increasingly digitized, right? So from the preschool, high school, we can see that our children have grown up in the technological world, okay? So therefore, as mentioned by the Prof Nasib yesterday, Prof Nasib Ahmed yesterday, he said that we have to catch up with their lingo. I mean, the uh, millennial lingo, the language, right? And digitalization is one of the language that we have to speak, okay? And um, so it's our initiative that we, uh, our um, uh, initiative to improve uh, the, I don't say that we have to move 100% from the traditional learning to non-traditional learning, uh, but I think we have to improve a bit on our traditional learning so that every put some element to make it more interactive and more up to date, okay? All right, so that's what was the interview, uh, overview of the uh, AR situation, okay? Now we go um, about the motivation, what motivates me to use uh, this magic technology in the course, okay? So of course, the first, uh, my first motivation in using the AR is in engineering uh, because it's my, my courses that I've been teaching, uh, which is my subject. I teach a manufacturing process. And we know that 
um, in manufacturing process, uh, students will learn a lot of a fabrication process such as um, uh, uh, which involve the complex system and equipment uh, like a casting process, injection molding, uh, metal forming like extrusion, forging, rolling, even now joining process or additive manufacturing. And uh, I believe that we cannot show them or we cannot bring them all in our labs uh, because some uh, maybe they have some limitation of the facilities that we have in our lab. So it's kind of a challenge for students to get the accurate visual if they only rely on, on listening to our lecture or reading the books or just um, watching the video that we provide, okay? So maybe we can put some of the uh, gamification game like they are playing something and that makes them interested to, to see the exact or uh, the uh, uh, real uh, visual from the uh, devices, okay? So the second reason, uh, uh, I see that because in engineering courses, we need, uh, it's necessary we go to site visit, okay? Because it's necessary for us to see the uh, uh, a real uh, machine or real process, right? For example, injection molding, we want to see what is going on inside the machine, okay? So it's very satisfied if we can go to the site and then see with my own eyes, right? And we also believe that the hands-on on learning and training that we give to students is actually an opportunity for the student to experience uh, the world situations. So those are elements uh, I believe that should have in uh, uh, engineering courses. Okay, so that's uh, motivation number two. The third one, uh, of course, uh, uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak, okay, everything went well, everything went out uh, online, okay. So this situation that actually challenged the education system uh, across the world, not only for students, but also for us as uh, teachers, lecturers, to move up from, the, from our comfort zone, all right? Actually, we have to be a bit tech savvy, right? We have to deliver our lecture uh, online and using slide within uh, on a platform like Zoom, MS Teams, and so on. And, um, and at the same time, we understand that we cannot uh, rely on the slides only or the lecture only, okay? We cannot expect that student read all our uh, slides or listen to our lecture or do revision and write reports. Okay, so we must think something that students can do their own learning activities, uh, even when they are in, uh, in their room and hostel. So for example, here is where I, this is when the pandemic, I did a lecture online. I asked them to open up the, uh, to on the camera and no one did that because they said that due to the technical issue, uh, their, their, their line is getting weak and so on. So that's the only me, right? So we cannot expect what they're doing behind the screen, okay? So I think that I have to put something that makes them move uh, uh, in terms of uh, physical, have a physical movement or uh, they do some activities that I think they increase their motivation in the subjects, okay? And uh, I did some uh, uh, research on say that um, the educators also agree to rely on the technology to enhance learnings. Okay, so this is uh, especially in after pandemic in 2020, we can see that uh, the report is uh, growing up. Okay, and um, so we can agree that uh, this technology that we use in the classroom is um, create engaging learning experience in and out of the classroom. Okay, not only in the class but also wherever they are. Okay. And here are some um, uh, 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 benefits of the AR technology in improving uh, the education experience, which is I uh, taken it from the few literature review. First, um, they said that by using um, by implementation of uh, augmented reality, it's often more accurate and detailed informative by visualize the complex objects. Okay, this is that I previously mentioned. Uh, where we can obtain the information through the visual of the relative size of a various perspective, okay, in a real environment, but through our devices, okay, so we can see the details. Secondly, is uh, by using AR, uh, it's a student-centered and personal learning, okay. It means that student can access 
uh, the content, the materials, uh, uh, anytime and anywhere. Okay. And the third one is uh, achieve better knowledge, retention, and dependent understanding of a specific subject because they can repeat, repeat, repeat it again. Okay. For example, I give you here uh, for the visual historical place of building from various countries. For example, if we uh, study about the historical, right? We don't need to have to go to the historical place and see the historic places. Maybe we can by uh, develop the augmented reality to the certain places, the historical places, then we can see the building, the, the arts, the structures, and so on. And then we can keep visiting this, the same place, okay? And the last but not least, um, so with AR, it enables students simply conduct dangerous experiments and interact with otherwise expensive machinery. Okay, for example, I did on uh, welding, for example, right? Maybe we can do some simulator, simulator on um, welding, joining by using augmented reality. I understand it's not 100% replace the hands-on that we're doing uh, in a real world, but maybe it's just some preparation, pre-preparation for the students before they enter to the real world. So it means that we can interact with other expensive machinery uh, over and over again without wasting the materials and so on. Or for example, here I give the example of the impact of corrosive chemical on a real world environment, which is we know that the corrosive chemicals is a danger to students. Maybe they can, but they want to learn what is actually uh, happen or what's the element that they inside the corrosive chemical. Or maybe we're using the augmented reality, we can zoom and uh, zoom out and then we can see in details what this actually is all about, okay? All right, so um, with you all of the uh, uh, consideration and um, of course uh, the, the previous information, I think that it is worth if I use AR in my teaching course, okay? And of course I have to do some pre-assessment, okay? So there is some of the question or issue that have been pointed out. Um, for example, how is the AR, the technology presented used in engineering courses? Is there any institute that have been used AR in their teaching? Um, can AR be used for learning tools and meet the pedagogical practices? This is one of the most important point that we have to consider, okay? Uh, or maybe uh, the third one is the lecturer's readiness, okay? Is, uh, is the lecturer like me is ready uh, to use AR as a, a teaching tools. And how about students? Okay, are the students is ready for the AR also or not? Okay. So after a few consideration, um, of course, some discussion with the experienced professors. Uh, so I think I, I want to start the implement of AR technology in my subject, which is the manufacturing process. Okay, so here, uh, uh, how I start uh, this project. Okay, so I begin uh, with the uh, questionnaire on a student's uh, readiness uh, for the devices, uh, interest, and so on. Okay, because we know that not all our students have a smartphone, uh, or maybe they are not capable to install or download uh, things that we want to. So we have to ask them. Okay, and uh, instead of this student readiness here, I also ask them if they have they um, experience using AR or not. So uh, this um, information is obtained uh, from um, my uh, previous lecture uh, in cohort 2021 and 2022, which is last semester, uh, within 115 students. So most of the uh, uh, majority, um, half of, more than half of my classes is not experienced using AR. But we know that actually AR is everywhere now, but they are not exposing, with, still not exposed using the AR, okay? And only 38% are using AR, okay? And I asked them also, how many, how many hours do they spend on their phone? So especially you can see that uh, more than half of students are spend their uh, uh, hours to uh, on screen is more than six hours, okay? So this is something that we have to think that uh, during our time, maybe we are ban a smartphone or, or phone to the school, but now we have to admit that the school is inside uh, the phone, so we have to bring it. So if within this more than six hours period of time, okay, um, now uh, they looking at the, 
the screen. So why not we give something that is beneficial to them? Okay, not it's just they're scoring out the, the TikTok or the uh, 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 Instagram and so on. Make them uh, uh, use the technology wisely, right? Okay, that is number one. After I see the readiness of my students, I think they are capable to uh, install and everyone has the smartphone and then are interested in uh, using AR. Then I we have, for the current moment, I, I identify the AR apps that are available uh, that can be these open sources that everyone can download, okay? So there is a um, lot of uh, AR apps available uh, in App Store or Google Play, okay? And but we have to make sure that we select the correct AR apps. Okay, so what features that uh, what factors uh, features that we are con need to consider in selecting the AR apps? For example, we need to consider whether it's adequate or suitable for the course. Okay, like for my of course, it's a manufacturing process. Either the apps is easy to access or difficult to access. Either it's uh, either the space is quite large. Okay, or either it light. Okay, how about the assessment workloads? How I want to implement, uh, uh, if I put this technology, uh, how is about the assessment? Okay, that one that I have to think to. And I have to make sure that the AR is more informative and attractive the, uh, um, uh, more than previous uh, method, okay, meditation method. So if you Google or you just uh, search on meta reality in App Store or in a Google Play, there's a lot. A ton of um, uh, apps, okay, but I, I, we have to try which one is uh, this is close and related to our course, okay. And of course, the third one, this is much very important that um, we have to ensure that the one that we apply in our uh, class is aligning with the course learning outcomes, okay. So here I give you the uh, method project process uh, uh, course learning outcome. So I need to layers the one the activities that I construct in class uh, is in line with the one that in outcomes. So I can see there's not much, not, not uh, clashing uh, much, but it gives you the value added to my uh, learning outcomes. Okay, so I think this is um, one of good point of using uh, um, up to date technology to the manufacturing process. Okay, because the manufacturing, manufacturing process is always up with the new technologies and new manufacturing. Okay, so uh, from the lot of the uh, apps that have been uh, searching uh, in uh, App Store and Google Play, uh, so I think that the one that is close to my course is a Unite AR. So I use Unite AR as the AR um, platform. Okay, even if you want to install it right now, you can search in your uh, Google Play or uh, App Store Unite AR. Okay, so this is the icon. Okay, so we can get it in both um, platform here. Why I choose this Unite AR? Because in Unite AR they give you a lot of um, contents in your gallery. Okay. Uh, which is they have an education, okay, they have a machines, they have an industrial. So all of this, I think that is related to my course on the manufacturing process. So this is how I have to relate uh, about the tools that we have to our topics. Okay, what I've done, uh, for example, like this, okay. So here we can see the some example available in the gallery. The first one is the gearbox, okay. If we select, okay, if you have the, the apps right now, we can uh, play around also. So we can select uh, uh, at the machine. I'm not sure which, which gallery is this, but they have a uh, gearbox. So if you can see that there's some movement and then the, the assemble, so what we can see that, we can see what's inside, right? So we can give the detailed information about what is inside the gearbox. Or maybe we can want to look at the engine block here. Oh, and sorry, the jet engine here. Okay, so we have the turbine blind, uh, turbine blade, and how it's joining. Since in manufacturing we have the uh, joining process, mechanical fastener. So what kind of um, uh, manufacturing involved uh, in uh, engine jet? And last one, maybe this one is engine block, all right? Uh, so uh, here is also one kind of uh, interactive. We can see the details inside the engine. Okay, so we don't have to see uh, 
uh, in a real engine uh, yet. So maybe we can go for the visual first. Okay, so they give uh, students um, the first impression of what kind of the objects they are talking about. And in my, in my case of manufacturing, what kind of manufacturing process that involves to fabricate all of this uh, compartment. Okay, for example, this is how I did uh, for my, uh, in my class, which is um, I asked students to um, uh, prepare some reports. Okay, so I asked them to download um uh, uh the uh first i give of course i give the lecture on um manufacturing process after a few weeks uh i will start uh introduce them what is the uh ar uh technology uh other technology with update technology then i ask them to uh install and play uh after the answer you can play um the 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 ar technology instead of outside class okay so they have to explore by themselves okay then maybe after one time i will ask them gather them together and then ask them what is kind of manufacturing process able to fabricate the parts okay so for example like this um for example i i ask them to choose one uh, so here i give the example of um, engine uh, uh, jet engine Okay, so discuss what the function of the machine of component. Okay, uh, so what they have to write a content, uh, report about it. And then um, what kind of a manufacturing uh, uh, that involves to fabricate the parts that you label it, for example, the blade. Okay, so the blade can be processed by what type of a suitable process. Okay, they have you, for example, casting. If you say the casting process, why you choose casting process? In terms of the cost, in terms of the materials, or they said, well, oh, it's just for one turbine light, turbine, turbine blade. So why not we use additive manufacturing? So in additive manufacturing, what types of what type of additive manufacturing that you choose? Maybe you see SLM, SLS, okay. And what is the 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 suitable uh, materials that you use, okay? And then. Uh, we have to discuss on the defects, uh, the process, okay, and so on. Um, so this is the example of the uh, self-assessment that I gave to my students previously. And um, uh, this is just repeated from the previous one. Uh, so this is how it looks like. So student will repeatedly see over and over again, and then they have to think and they have to discuss uh, what um, uh, they are choosing okay so this is the example of my students uh, uh, reports okay I think I, I should uh, share you the one with the uh, complete reports um, so I have to stop sharing this one and start sharing okay all right so this is uh, the report that have been done, uh, the assessment. Uh, actually, it's an individual assessment for students um, uh, to look at, at the AR and manufacturing process. Okay, so they for this like for these students, uh, uh, she use uh, she select the gearbox here, and then she put the function. All of the the question have been uh, answered. Okay, what the element that is uh, that. Uh, she chose and so on. Okay, what the manufacturing process and all the justification must be put in here, and then the problem and occur and solution they have to, uh, uh, that they see. Okay, and they put some uh, references. So this why I just let them to do the reports, um, and uh, I will evaluate through the the the, the presentation that they uh, give uh, the reports and the content. Okay, so I will continue to my slides. Um, this one. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so this is uh, two of my students uh, uh, for their assessment. Okay. And um, of course, after we uh, do the, the experiment or we do the assessment and we need to get uh, the uh, feedback from student because we know that feedback from student is a key factor to assess the implementation, the success implementation of their experience. Okay, 
So I give them the QR code. So they have to uh, scan and then they have to answer the question before uh, they submit the, uh, the assessment. Okay. So there's a few questions that I ask them. Okay. Are they excited about learning? Okay. Some, this is one guy, one fellow is not very excited about that. Okay. Other than that, yeah, agree and strongly agree. Uh, maybe this I ask them after they are uh, using implement or a play with the AR. Are they uh, aware about the importance of computer technology? Oh, sorry, I, I forgot of this. Okay, maybe this one they say fifty one percent is strongly agree. Okay, and um, uh, most of it is agree and neutral. So agree and strongly agree. Okay, uh, this part for the third one, maybe I think I have to put effort on this because uh, the AI application has understand the application in manufacturing process. Uh, this one, I think this is quite important that I have to think uh, because it's about the understanding and the application. So they said that most of the students at about the 16, uh, if I, I um, look at it, disagree is a one person, a neutral is a 16%. So they have a 70 students not really understand, 70% uh, of students not really understand uh, or what is application for in a manufacturing process. Maybe I have to give more, uh, um, focus more on the third one. Okay, and the fourth, the use of AR apps make learning more focused and fun. Of course, uh, they, they are all, everyone, uh, most of them I agree, I strongly and strongly agree. So. I can see that 89% is agreed that this AR makes the learning fun and focus. And also I get uh, some feedback for them. Okay, uh, so this is the honest way from them. They say that it's easier for me to understand the topic gives visual image that I can see. It's fun to use AR to learn. Okay, hope we can have more opportunities to learn using AR in future. Okay, fun and exciting, very intriguing. Helpful students to more understanding about manufacturing process, interactive, makes more learning more fun and so on. And I also get this kind of a feedbacks, which is from Anonymous. Um, he just WhatsApp one of the professor, uh, just give you know, a feedback, uh, volunteering, uh, 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 volunteer feedback to the professor. She said that, um, uh, one of the best work is the AR assignment. You got very excited and using AR uh, in top of the educational perspective. Okay, so so from this kind of feedback, I can see the potential AR uh, technology as uh, uh, teaching uh, tools in uh, any courses. Okay, and I also give uh, compare give a comparison. Uh, before they are using AR and after using AR. So before I enter the topics of AR, I just give one uh, basic questions. And for example, do you think that AR apps have the potential to be used as teaching? And then um, mm, uh, they said the story 80 to 30 percent and agree 46 percent neutral 18 percent. Uh, and there's one guy still uh, is not agree with me. Okay. Maybe uh, after using AR, how you feel? Okay, maybe this guy is change of mind from strongly disagree to disagree. Okay, I'm not. I don't know who this person, but uh, maybe it's something that is not understand, or maybe it's not uh, very interesting in interact with the AR. But most of them, I can see that they strongly agree. The percentage is increased. Okay, from the agree to uh, strongly disagree. Um. Okay, uh, I also uh, uh, asked about the field, about the use of AR. Uh, so most of the students, the majority said it's interactive. Okay, the 50% of neutral. And still this one guy, I think this is a same person. Uh, this is not agree with me. It said that it's not interactive at all. Okay, but we are working on it. Okay, maybe I have to change um, uh, uh, method or something. Okay, but still they have a limitation of unit AR. Okay, I don't think that unit AR is the perfect for my course. Okay, so because as a lecturer, we understand what we want to deliver to student and what student have to learn. Okay, because in unit AR, we can do a quiz at the same platform. Okay, um, uh, we cannot uh, uh, give a lot of information because there's some limitation in it because we are not uh, the 
uh, fabricator of the unit AR, right? So this um, just uh, give me some uh, idea. Why not if we have our own AR that is that can customizable content that fit our needs? Okay. So I bring out this project, and then this is the current work direction, uh, which is I try to develop our own AR apps. Okay. So here is actually our own apps, which is a mechanical um, plus AR, okay, mechanical plus augmented reality, which is Mekar, which is in Mekar uh, in English, uh, in meaning of Bloom, okay. So Mekar Equicam. So I give you a sneak peek on this. It's not 100% uh, done yet, but it's just 30%. Um, okay. Uh, so what is different with others? Uh, augmented reality that are available in a um, uh, uh, store. Uh, our augmented reality, I mean the, the surrounding that we want to use is the real uh, world uh, or the real visual that students uh, uh, can see. For example, uh, in their bedroom, in their uh, classroom, in the in cafe, cafeteria and so on. So when I put this kind of like, for, for example, in their bedroom, in their hostel, okay? So when they scan in the hostel, okay, what, for, for, for example, like this, okay, for the bedroom. So maybe we can see that they want to see how is the mark, uh, cup of mark, okay, cup uh, mark uh, in process, okay? When they uh, can see that, uh, for example, like this, okay? So when they choose this mark, uh, eventually they will give you information, what kind of the materials or maybe uh, the, uh, the, the process evolved to produce, okay? For example, this one is a ceramic. What is the process that is suitable for the ceramic, okay? Uh, so they're still undergoing project, okay? So we are focusing on maybe in their bedroom and then maybe we can put uh, their, uh, their um, uh, few, few types of uh, environment, okay? And also we have a few uh, objects like plastic bottle, uh, tin, racket, guitar, or everything, okay? Um, of course, uh, this is how I do it. I use uh, Unity. Maybe Mr. Tanzun Islam will be familiar with this. So I use Unity to fabricate, to develop my ODR, okay? So this is just I get from the 3D model from the internet, okay? But I want to put something like uh, the our uh, novelty, maybe I have to put um, the logo or something, okay? Then we can put some information at this, okay? By using all of this panel, okay? And then, so the, the, uh, the information will appear at the uh, AR apps later on, okay? So this is our apps. Uh, so this is my current um, uh, features uh, in, in my phone. So you can see that. So this is my phone, okay. Uh, so, so here is the apps, okay. Uh, we're not available in the market yet, uh, only in my phone because I'm the one who can see it uh, still in a developing process, okay. So once I uh, click this, so th this one will appear, okay. So this is how we play around with the augmented reality and the objects and so on and the manufacturing process. So you can see that after I you have, to say, you, have, you have to wrap up now. Because okay, all right. This yeah. is just one. Uh, I want to say that about the challenges with AR. Okay, mm -hmm. you know that they have still such a technology and skill gaps. Okay, the lack of knowledge or skill by the lecturers, uh, instructors. Uh, since we know that. We need a support, <laughs> we need a fund to develop this if I want to develop our own or even if we want to scrap, scrap the existing one, which is much, uh, which is expensive, okay? But I believe that has uh, the existing one that is applicable for the um, uh, engineering. Uh, what we have to say about the connective challenge, how does the lecturer need to, uh, to do multi-tests, such as teaching, answering questions, opening device, and so on and uh, implementation risk of AR. Okay, we don't know how far that AR can uh, go with this uh, uh, in, in, in engineering course. Okay, so it's just the conclusion. Okay, we can see that uh, the students uh, is agreed. Uh, uh, can be, uh, uh, AR can be used as a teaching tools and it makes uh, the, the uh, 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 learning as helpful in the understanding of manufacturing process. 
And uh, we can see that, as I previously mentioned, that it's not extensively used yet. So I think there's a lot of potential can be exploited. Okay, so within those, so this is uh, what's an explanation that we had from the, our AR apps. Okay, and um, so this is a series of my lectures of hybrid learning, AR, and so on. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Dr. Naishra. I think uh, very, I mean, good presentation, good example, and good effort. Uh, but we are running out of time, maybe, but Dr. Uh, Mr. Tahzinul Islam has a short question for you. Yep. Uh, and because I see that your, both of your work is uh, like supporting or, I mean, uh, very interrelated, you know. So he's asking, how would you facilitate deeper interactions in the AR app? I'm thinking higher level critical thinking, not just component description. Uh, assembly uh, okay. Or, okay so how, how what's your response to that yeah it's all right uh, actually this is not replacing 100 percent of our teaching materials okay so it's just one part okay uh so we don't go for the uh, higher level critical thinking yet okay it's just for the make uh students are uh, interactive with the uh, the the topics okay so if i say how i facilitate the deep interaction first i have to uh give the 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 uh uh, explanation about what is AR, how we develop this AR, what is the significance of AR in our worldwide here. Okay, everyone now using AR. Even you are in um, uh, in in daily life, without we are um, uh, realize it or not, we are actually using AR in our daily life. But how we want to apply this AR in our education, in our uh, learning process, we don't use that. We never talk about that. Okay, we just with uh, playing games. We just use when we are doing uh, to get information from the commercialization, or maybe if you look at at the box of the Cocoa Crunch and Nestle behind that, you can see there's a lot of AR information. Okay, we can get the information by AR, but not in our teaching uh, or teaching and learning activities. Okay, we don't have the books or the materials yet that can provide a particular uh, 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 learning uh, when we can scan. Maybe they have one in in um, uh, medical department when we just scan, and then we can see that the real uh, anatomy uh, uh, within the books, but not in engineering. Okay, so as uh, instructor, as the lecturer, what we have to do to facilitate the deeper understanding is we need to guide them. Okay, for example, I give the the example. For example, the one that I see. Give it is the uh, engine jet. Okay, what is inside the engine jet is a turbine blade. So in one turbine, I take out from this turbine blade and I see I put it in one slide. What is turbine blade? How we manufactured that? Okay, so there's a few right for processes, and in that a few processes, what can be discussed on the processes, the manufacturing processes. So that is kind of that uh, when they go back and then when they do their own, so they have to think, they have to mismatch. Okay, when we are select, for example, they want to they choose car. Okay, so to make a car. Okay, a big car. So what kind of a processes? It's not logic that we have to use additive manufacturing to build a car yet. Okay, maybe it's just a simple um, uh, forming metal forming. So that kind of the logic thinking. So we want to um, have students to uh, develop student those kind of skills. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Anyway, well, any comments or feedbacks uh, is most welcome since this also is new. Yeah. Uh, just a comment on the last part you mentioned manufacturing processes. It's one of my favorite courses. Um, I think actually it is a perfect course for AR because essentially mm -hmm. you can give them a sit like the final exam that we had using Kalpakjian's book in uh, UPM. It was uh, make how do you make a, for example, model? You know, do you use plastic uh, injection molding or, you know, yes. what kind of forming or stuff like that? It's very simple and it can be done easily with multiple choice and using the wrong technique. Sometimes there can be multiple techniques to get the final part. Uh, I mean, multiple uh, right answers. You can show them the final output using the multiple choice. Like if you use the wrong method, what happens? Something funny happens. So I think it's a perfect course, as you said. Thank you. Yeah. 
and okay, great presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Nasra. We are running out of time. I have only 20 more minutes to conclude this session, and I have one more presentation. Okay, so thank I you. Yeah, I take the opportunity to thank Dr. Nasrahani for the presentation. And I now move on to the last presenter uh, for this session. Uh, the last presenter is Professor Dr. M.D. Raisuddin Khan. Uh, he is a professor at the International Islamic University in Malaysia for many, many years. He has uh, many research grants, uh, awards, scholarships for his research activities and projects. Uh, his current research activities are on snake robot modeling, automatic car parking system, and disabilities rehabilitation. Professor Raiz Sudin also has supervised many uh, postgraduate and undergraduate uh, thesis. Uh, he has been involved in different professional services and community development activities, and also participating in conferences. He has published many papers in uh, reputable journals and conferences, and he has served as reviewer for many conferences and journal focusing on science and engineering research. So with that, Professor Rai Sudin, I think we have very limited time. Uh, I hope that uh, I think uh, you can share now your topic on application of case studies in engineering education selected example. The floor is yours, Professor Rai Sudin. Uh, can you see my slides? We can see your list of files. List of files. Yeah, list of files. Is it okay now? Uh, yes, please, yes. Okay, thank you, for, uh, Mr. Chairman, Prof. Faris, for kind introduction. So my topic is already announced, application of case studies in engineering education and selected examples. So this is my presentation offline, background, case studies in research and teaching, case selection, report, uh, writing and presentation, assessment, conclusion. So I just received this morning this uh, cartoon from my friend, professor in Memphis, humans are hooked, machines are learning. Okay, so we can see the way my previous presenters went, that actually we are now going to use these uh, phones to pass to the learner so that they can learn effectively. So AR, VR, so I think is the next generation teaching. But still we need to go onto the field. So this was uh, the uh, case study actually I did based on a course we developed uh, in our next curriculum. And this is from the university. So in our curriculum design, we consider uh, the SDGs, specifically goal four, nine, 12, and 17. And to accommodate uh, the specifically the sustainability, which is very misunderstood, specifically among the engineers. So the university actually initiated a course to introduce uh, the beginning of the engineering career, as well as for the other students in different faculties. So the course title is Sustainable Development Issues, Practices, and Policies. So if you go to the... Um, if you go to the course material, so course material basically covers the 
principles of sustainability. And if you just look at the highlights at the bottom, the teaching is through multiple case studies. Students are expected to understand the challenges and barriers to integrating sustainable development at local, national, and international levels. So this course has got a component of case studies. And if you go to the definition of case studies, case studies definition in case of research and in case of teaching, they are not exactly the same. A case study in case of the research is basically to study the case to identify the problem. And based on the problem, basically we have to initiate the hypothesis the, and the solution procedure or methodology and everything. But if you go for the case studies in teaching, this is, it can be a case presented uh, as a story, a case presented in some real context, or a case can be presented like in virtual reality. So the student will study the case and they will fulfill the goals of the course out of the study of the case. So with this as a background, we choose that for this sustainability course, we need to undertake case studies. And it was during the pandemic. So it was very difficult to expose the students to the real film. But anyway, we did it uh, something and I, I think it worked well. So when we choose the case studies, we have the guidelines, the learning goals, which is basically coming from the course outline, learning activities, same, complexity of the scenario. So that the sustainability components we call in brief EES, that is economy, environment, and society. So the scenario involves these elements so that the student can correlate. And the students' prior knowledge, basically we had some uh, delivery, lecture delivery before that. So they have been introduced with the terminology and everything. And of course the time frame, they have to finish it within a few weeks. Generally at the end of the semester, we keep this uh, case study. So if you look at the learning outcomes, so these are the learning outcomes. And the learning, less learning outcome to work together as member society to develop alternative and creative solution to address the issues of sustainable development on campus community. But uh, I didn't concentrate on campus only because I com concentrate uh, nationally basically. So what we did in this course, it has a lot of sections. I think they have more than uh, 30 sections. Uh, my section was the section number 16. I had around 40 students. And these are the students from the whole uh, university. So you can say they are coming from uh, Kaye, that is architecture, then Islamic revealed knowledge, KICT. Uh, down there, you can say Kulia of Engineering, Kulia of Engineering, uh, then Ahmad Ibrahim, uh, Kulia of Law. So the wide range of students were actually working in this uh, uh, course. So we identified some uh, cases. So the first one you can see, we, there was quite a number. Uh, rehabilitation of Pusu rivers. We have a river inside the campus called Sungai Pusu or Pusu River. So these were assigned to these students. Flash floods in Selangor. So Malaysia on and off, they face this uh, flash flood. So this is uh, also included in this. Deforestation and biological losses in Sarawak. Sarawak is basically well known for his uh, uh, forestry and hills, but uh, there are a lot of deforestation happening. So that's why it was a case. Sustainability issues in Malaysian palm oil industry, landslide in Cameroon Hull. So these were the projects uh, we took it. And the students need to undertake observation of scenario, identify the elements in the scenario related to the pillars of sustainability, identify problems based on the study, propose solution to the problems, submit a report, present the report. So those were their activities in relation to the case studies. And now if I share their reports and presentations. Uh, 
can you see the report? No, we we still see your slide. Okay, now we are looking at your list of files. Maybe you need to unshare this one first and share the report. Uh, because I, I was trying to share the whole folder where it is not yeah. <laughs> working. Okay, I think now it's okay. So yes. this is one of the presentation out of their uh, case studies. So here you can see the four uh, students were involved. So they are submitting. So they are presenting a background. They are putting the pictures. So because this is the river inside the campus. So they took the pictures from some locations. And they also uh, added some uh, uh, religious uh, remarks uh, based on some hadith uh, related to the, so the world is sweet and green and very rare Allah is going to install you as vigilant in its indoor to see how it acts. <laughs> So they have their contents as well. So here you can see they are, uh, went to the Google map. So identified the river, river terrain. They went to the uh, data sources regarding the river. So they came up with the, uh, different data, the pollution, TSS, BOD, uh, uh, nitrous oxide and all these things. Then, they identify the objective uh, uh, out of their case study to determine the importance of rehabilitation of uh, Pusu River, to acknowledge the challenges to rehabilitating Pusu River, to recommend on how to improve the quality of water in the Pusu River. Then they identify the problem statement. They didn't put in the uh, form of the problem statement. You can see they actually put what are the problems is drying out not enough of water in different locations, and what are the causes of the pro problems, trash littering, sewage leakage, mining and clearance activities, uh, and all these things. Then significance uh, of the river, clean water supply, comfort to community, prevent flash flood, so what are the problems that are fight uh, according to this uh, grading? So, and here you can see this is a scenario of flash flooding. So they have uh, conceptualized how the rivers uh, are related to the issues of solving the flash flooding. So if the rivers are uh, not well dressed and terrain are not well maintained, so they have uh, during the heavy rain, so it cannot accommodate the flow and the flash flood will happen. And they came up with the solutions as well. So solution within the community. So campaign, a campaign river cleaning, spread awareness about the Pusu River, uh, video competition, talks and forum, the importance of river, people will appear, appreciate more on river, volunteer work, give benefits to others, organize and participate uh, into Gotong growing activities. Gotong growing is a Malay term, which actually uh, means uh, working together. 
solution within community. So these were basically the causality relations that which they learned in inside the sustainability course. So they put uh, identified the elements as we mentioned there. Then solution by IOM administration. So they identified the, who other parties can help solve the problems. So in this case, pond excavation because this uh, river has got connected some ponds actually. Uh, so it is not a discrete pond. These are the ponds. Uh, you can consider that as if these are the small lakes uh, connected to this river. Then proper sewage treatment because uh, we have a lot of hostels uh, in the campus and also residential areas. So the sewage is, uh, if not well treated and sent to the river, so the river get polluted and that can kill the biota uh, along with the uh, river. Then standard operating procedure. So this is because you can see among cafeteria and food courts. So, so how they are going to dispose of their stops. So basically when they are cleaning and washing, the water is actually draining out uh, straight away to the uh, river. So in that case, uh, we need to have the standard oper operating procedure. Untreated sewers should not be thrown into the river, not remove the used cooking well or well, while you food directly from the sink, have another alternative. Okay, so this is the solution with the authority action to be taken by Salanga State uh, Irrigation and Drainage Department. Because one of the problems that is, was identified regarding this river, this is upstream uh, sand mining, which actually causes the degradation of the uh, place retaining the water. So it needs the solution from the um, state authority. Then integrate river basin management coordination process. File a complaint with the university regarding discomfort with the environment in the university area, extending the width of the channel and increasing the sedimentation supply. Action needs to be taken by the Department of Environment. So they also classify who will be involved more, the so community, the institution, and the, at the highest level, the authority. And challenges they are identified, land clearing and sand mining is one of the challenges which is happening upstream. Point source pollution, which is basically coming as a drain from different the hostels and catchment land uses. So we have some catchment lands upstream, so, so that has been not properly. Utilized. Students, they also conducted some survey on the students' opinion on factors contributing to the Pusu River uh, pollution, deforestation, poor sewage uh, treatment, mining activities, urbanization. And they have the recommendation the water treatment for the river, protection of clean water for human consumption. And the second is control of flood water movement to preserve lives and protect property. And they have uh, the conclusions out of it. So we can see out of this report, which is that uh, during the presentation, actually when they submit the report, sub, uh, report submissions, groups or report submission. And in the assessment, while I marked this, I marked as a single entity of the report, not that the individual students, but while they are presenting, this present, these slides were presented by all the members. So they took the distribution share. So who is going to present the first few slides, then second and third and fourth. So those were the individual marks actually uh, I did uh, do uh, out of this uh, presentation. And similarly, they have support, submitted a report. So report, uh, Okay, so report submission, uh, they have they have done report submissions. We have we gave a actually format to submit the report. They submitted the report, and then to assess individual again because if he, when they were submitting the case studies, they know they are individual cases. But during the presentation of the case studies, all the students were present. 
So they were listening to the presentation of all individual case studies. So I conducted a quiz. So you can see this quiz actually contains some of these, uh, uh, what is called, uh, case studies. So in this case, the landslide was one, then this is a specific item, the spirituality, how it can uh, enhance the sustainability. And then when we evaluated against this uh, course, so we find, unlike my other courses, in this case study, the results were uh, tremendously uh, good. So you can say, uh, 30, so more than uh, 60% A, A minus and uh, lower grades are significantly low compared to my other courses. Just last semester, I taught a course, uh, Tamil Sciences. I don't want to disclose what was the failure. It was a significantly high failure. Anyway, the many other lecturer has got the same experience. They are just uh, in the post pandemic, the failure rate actually significantly increased. As uh, most of us are actually uh, taking into cognition that the cheating is a very common issue among the students, specifically when they go for online teaching and learning. So this course though, it was uh, online, but here the cheating issue is not uh, uh, is not possible because it is individual case and they are actually presenting their individual cases. And they are attending the quizzes and quizzes actually covering the other elements which they cannot actually action. So uh, this is the way we can see the marking was uh, fair and whatever they achieved that they deserve. And if I conclude, uh, uh, on the studies. So you can say the student activity actively participated in the case study activities. Sustainability has been understood in terms of real context. Group activities happen, help solve real life problems. Students understood their social responsibilities. Performance was highly satisfactory. Other courses are recommended to implement case study. Okay, and um, that's the end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Rai Sudin. Uh, so now it's already uh, 12.41 in Bangladesh. So, okay, so uh, if I can, uh, I mean, take home message from Professor Rai Sudin's uh, presentation is uh, uh, the students are uh, exposed to real problems. They have to identify uh, real problem statements as well as they have to work together in the interdisciplinary uh, setting to come up with, of course, uh, real and original solutions. Okay, uh, maybe if there is one question we can entertain before we wrap up the session, let me see whether there is any question from the floor. Uh, so there is no real questions. Uh, okay, so with that, maybe Prof. Mazaharo, I think the time is running out. So I, can I now, uh, okay, maybe there is one, one short question from Mr. Tazinul Islam, the Prof. Rasidah, if you, if you want to address, what tips would you advise on creating successful case study scenarios? So maybe one or two minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Tazan. Uh, I think I already uh, showed uh, one of the elements in this uh, slide. When we select the cases, we must select the cases based on the course. So the course has got the course, the course learning outcomes. So which learning outcome or how, how many learning outcomes you want to accommodate it in your case study? Accordingly, you have to choose your case. That, uh, uh, as I mentioned in my thermal science courses, the last time the failure was high. So I am planning to have a case study in the next semester on thermal sciences. So in thermal sciences, uh, one of the issue I discovered, I, I tried many times this, but the, the students all, all, all the time they fail it. I generally, in the beginning of the class, I introduce uh, what is thermodynamics and what is the transfer. Then I present a uh, two cycles, one is the refrigeration cycle and another is the power cycle. Then I correlate what are these elements, which has got the element of 
converting the energy and which has the, the converting transferring the heat. So that is the way I correlate uh, the uh, two elements of the course. And then onwards actually I move. Now the next plan for me, so in this case, I will, after introducing, I will introduce the concepts of enthalpy, entropy, and all these things. And then I will pass it again, okay, identify the locations where the enthalpies are increasing, where the enthalpies are decreasing, what are the elements contributing to the increase or decrease, I think that, that is the way they may get a, a real understanding of what is the reality, how things uh, uh, go uh, in a real system. Yeah. And if I could follow up really quickly, uh, what resources are you using to get these case studies? Like, are you taking industrial case studies or doing your own research online? Oh, this is a, we are actually, we are not giving the case scenarios. We are actually giving the, uh, some problem the societies are facing. So you see, we have posed the uh, rehabilitation of Sungai Pusu. So Sungai Pusu is a river inside the university campus and it has a lot of problems. So we told them that this is the river flowing through the uh, campus and it has of course its uh, uh, problems. And if it is in a good state, it will give a lot of benefit. So now you correlate in terms of your sustainability course what are the economic elements, what are the environment elements, and what are the social elements really related to this uh, river. And you put in your case, what are the problems, who are the parties involved in the problem solution, and what will be the solution. So those were the uh, brief, they have been briefed before the cases have been uh, taken. Thank you, great presentation. Thank you very much. I think I am running out of time. Uh, I have to wrap up the session and whoever that have more questions to the panelists, I think we can uh, contact them directly through email. So as the uh, session chair, let me take this opportunity to thank all the panelists. Uh, Dr. Javid Kito from the University of Oklahoma, USA. Mr. Tazinul Islam from York University, Canada. Dr. Nashara Hani Genti Jamadum from UKM, Malaysia, and Professor Dr. M.D. Raisuddin Khan from IIM. Also, I would like to thank the organizer uh, from Ahsanul University of Science and Technology, Bangladesh. Uh, the convener is Professor Mazharul Islam. So I would like to thank all the organizing committee. I will congratulate all of you for the successful symposium. So with that, I pass back to uh, Professor Al Sheikh, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, it's, it has been very exciting and uh, very fruitful presentations from all presenters. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, nothing more to say except that uh, just to remind everyone that we will be meeting again. Uh, at uh, let me check the time. It should be two o'clock, two o'clock uh, Bangladesh time. That will be four o'clock here in Malaysia. So we will see you all, inshallah, uh, a little bit more than one hour. Yeah, about 70, 72 minutes uh, from now, inshallah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Salam alaikum. I'll see you. See you later, inshallah. Okay. Okay, Salam Alaikum, Professor Mazharul. I saw also Professor Yulfian there. Salam Alaikum. Yes, Salam Alaikum, Prof. Apa kah, Prof. Ahmad, Faris. All right, thank you. Ah, uh, you still have time. Yeah, uh, even you are, you are very busy. I think, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Are you Prof. Yulfian? Yeah, hi. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for the for the presentations. Yeah. I'll be in the next uh, sessions, uh, Prof, inshallah. <laughs>